Welcome to the POD cast, the podcast, the pride of Detroit podcast, as we call it. You can find us live here on youtube.com slash at pride of Detroit at twitch.tv slash pride of Detroit or wherever you find your podcast. All things Detroit Lions news analysis right here, right now. My name is Jeremy Reisman filling in for the adequate host. Uh, I am the producer over at Pride of Detroit. You can find me at Detroit Online on Twitter with me, as always, for the POD cast, senior editor of Pride of Detroit, The Rock God, at Ryan underscore POD on Twitter. Ryan Matthews is here. Ryan, how we doing, buddy? I'm doing well, man. Kick to me first um, because I'm, you know, next next man up. That's right. Speaking of next man up. So wait, are you... I'm filling in for Chris. Does that mean you're filling in for me and this third person is filling in for you? Is that how it works? That's really going to put things in a twist for me here for a second, but I, I think that math checks out. Okay. Well, that's it's kind of like the thing on the offensive line. Maybe you just want one person to fill in for someone else and everyone else stay at their own position, you know? This way we're shuffling. shuffling. Yeah, there's yeah. too much shuffling. It's going to throw off the, the whole juju of the of the podcast. And I don't want to be the wet blanket the whole episode, so <laughs> let's stick to our roles, huh? Okay, sure. So the the next person who is filling in for me, I think, is what we've established. <laughs> he is a writer for Pride of Detroit. You can see him all over our U- YouTube page as well. He's also at mcannon313 on Twitter. Morgan Cannon is here. Morgan, welcome back to the pod, buddy. What's up, guys? Glad to be here. I'm glad you're here um, because we are going to spend this entire podcast breaking down the NFL Combine, which just wrapped up its final uh, events and measurements and all that Monday. Um, if you're looking for our preview, our free agency preview podcast, that is going to be coming later in the week. We decided we needed to kind of compartmentalize here. We've plenty to talk about for, with the NFL combine, even though free agency is just a week away that deserves its own podcast. Don't worry. We're going to get it out in plenty of time before all the negotiating and, and, and tampering happens, but let's start with the NFL combine. And before we get into all the players, and measurements and all that sort of stuff. Um, obviously, going down in Indy is a time where rumors and um, news and, and mingling happens. And so we got a few little nuggets from both the local beat and the national beat, uh, most of which surround, I would say, extensions, guys that the lines want to resign. And it seems like right now I'm on Ross St. Brown, contract extensions heating up. It was first Dave Burkett who reported that. Uh, Amon Ra's agency was down there in India and planning on meeting with Detroit. And then ESPN's Dan Granziano uh, reports that he's expecting a deal somewhere between 26 and 28 million a year for Amon Ra. So Ryan, I'm going to throw to you first. You cool with that number? Yeah, I think I'm very cool with that number. That sounds like a great number. Let's get that locked in ASAP because you, you know, behind the scenes, I am of the belief that Amon Ra is very much in consideration for being a top five wide receiver. And we, when you look at some of that, that money um, that surrounds him, if, if that's going to be where the contract ends up settling, I mean, you look at the deal that Mike Evans got, you know, uh, today, you know, two year contract, 52 million bucks. Okay. I mean, that's a guy who's a little bit, you know, long in the tooth, much older than Amon Ra St. Brown. That seems very much like a veteran reward contract um, for one last big contract. So, Amon Ra's in a little bit of a different place, but Jeremy, you talk about some of the other names that that are up there. I mean, it's Tyreek Hill at thirty million. Yep. Um, Justin Jefferson is is expected to get you know a really really big contract, and I, I'm assuming right that it's going to be a number north of that. Yep. So it, it it seems like that number that you put out for Amon Ra twenty six twenty eight million. It seems like right around the sweet spot for where his contract should be. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I, I think I, I was crossing my fingers and hoping maybe it would come in a twinge under twenty five million, but that was always kind of like I think hopeful hopefulness coming from my end. But like we also have to fi- figure in the fact like the Lions were so fortunate to be having Amon Ra at under a one million dollar salary for each of his first three years of his career because he was a fourth round pick um yep. on a rookie deal. So maybe he's due for a little overpay. And I'm not even saying twenty six to twenty eight million is an overpay necessarily, but Dude, dude has earned his money, right, Morgan? Oh, he, he 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 had one of the best seasons a Lions wide receiver has ever had. Yeah, right. And on a fourth round contract, so yeah, like I completely agree with you, Jeremy. Like, 
it's he's do it because he his production and the way he sets the tone like him and Panay are probably the two biggest tone setters on the team um, in terms of how they go about their business uh, everything right so you're paying him for that and yeah I think you're you're sweetening it a little bit more because dude was an all pro a first team all pro on a fourth round rookie deal so yeah it's almost like a little get back and just, you know, making sure he's real happy because he's obviously made the Lions really happy, right? Yeah. I, I I think that's a good point that Morgan just brought up, though, comparing him to Panay in terms of tone setters, and they're young guys and moving forward. You're almost paying Amon Ra that deal because of the kind of tone he's going to set in that wide receiver room, right? Like, he's the guy who's always working after practice, catch, catching extra balls on the jugs machine. Like, that's the guy that you want to be the the – you know, the leader in your room, you're going to, you're going to pay a little premium for that on top of the fact that he's an awesome talent, Jeremy. Yeah. Not, not that the lines need to do this, but it's also a good message center throughout their locker room. Like if you work as hard as this guy, here's what we're going to give you. Um, and that, that way Amon Ron doesn't have to do any more Las Vegas appearances for money because apparently he was a uh, feeling a little broke. Um, yeah, no more, no more cure auto insurance <laughs> commercials for oh, Amon Ross St. Brown. He's they graduated. They got everybody on the cure, man. Soon we're going to see Cider or someone up there. They got to get someone from the Red Wings and that they'll complete the whole deal. Amon Ra has, has elevated to Dr. Romani. Like, that's that's where he's next. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be those yeah. local commercials. Perfect. Shout out. Shout out to anyone who gets that reference. Um, <laughs> next topic here, Jonah Jackson. Uh, it's been very quiet regarding him and anything really at all. Um, there was a report out there, I can't remember who did it, so my apologies, but saying like they were not even close last year going into the season and, and coming up with an extension. Now Jeremy Fowler of ESPN is reporting that um, because it's such a strong guard market and because there's such a, a need for guard uh, on free agency, he's expecting Jonah Jackson amongst some a couple others to get upwards of, of maybe $16 million a year or more, which I think has led to most Lions fans saying... No thanks, buddy. Morgan, is that, is that kind of where you're at right now? Yeah, it's kind of where I – like, I want – Jonah Jackson's great when he's on the field. Like, objectively, the Lions' elite offensive line is even more elite when he's in there at left guard, you know, getting in space and operating next to Frank Bragnow uh, and Decker. But, yeah, I think it's just going to – he's going to price himself out of what the Lions would want to give him. I think a team like – New York, like the Giants or someone who really has a need for a guard is going to throw a big old bag of money at him. And yeah, I'm pretty sure, and barring something crazy happening, Jonah Jackson's played his last game in the Lions uniform. Is that where you think yeah. things are going, Ryan? It, it seems like things are trending that way, especially when we get into uh, the next uh, part of the podcast a little bit further down the way when we start talking about the combine, because my goodness, there's an awful lot of interior offensive linemen. Yeah out there for the taking in the draft. And I, I know that the Fowler report put out, you know, that there's, there, there, are, there are some guards that could be hitting free agency and there's going to be a demand there, but it does seem like, like you said, Jeremy, that the lions and Jonah were pretty far apart. I'm not sure about what Jonah's played this year would have brought them closer together on a number. Right. Unless, unless they dragged him down. Um, which usually isn't the case of a guy coming off his rookie deal. Um, yeah, it, this is a really tough one for me still because, you know, Brad Holmes even said in his postseason presser, like, we're going to make sure the offensive line is, is attended to. We're not going to let that drop off. We know it's how our offense runs. We know how important it is. This this team has spent a lot of resources on the offensive line and, and will continue to do so. And, they weren't great when he wasn't on the field. They they don't really have, you know, they, they like Aushika and, and they probably bring him back as an exclusive rights free agent. They probably signed Graham Glasgow, I would imagine. I think we all think it, it's headed in that direction considering that the mutual interest there. But what do they think of Colby Sorstel? Is he, is he anywhere near ready? And if not, what are they going to do about it? I don't think, you know, I, I, I agree with you, Ryan, that this draft is, is full of a bunch of, very playable assets on day one or day two of the draft, but are the lines prepared to go into the draft with no other answer at left guard? That I don't, th I don't think so. It, I don't it either. Seem like it doesn't seem like they would put themselves in that spot because 
does it does that how much of that has to do with Colby's play last year though? Like I think they they saw enough to say, hey, we have a guy here who's going to take a little while. I mean, I I don't think that they would have ever thought in their right mind, hey, we're drafting this guy as somebody who will be ready, you know, after this season to take over for Jonah Jackson. I, I don't I don't think they drafted him with that plan in mind. And and I don't think they maybe draft a lot of players past I don't know, even past day three. Yeah. Right. With 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 that in mind. So it it seems like they would turn to free agency for at least an option. Right. right. At, at least a camp body, at least a veteran that they can have on, you know, on call or on standby in, in case they get the guy that they maybe draft on, on day two or day three or even day one it isn't, you know, totally 100 percent ready. Yeah. I'm right there with Ryan. Oh, go ahead. No, no, we finished. You can finish that. I was going to say, um, like, that's I'm 100% where I'm at. Like, even if they sign a decent free agent, right? And you, you, they are, I'm sure they do like Colby. And even if they do like Colby, if we were playing that one game that y'all play, the one thing I think I know, <laughs> it would, for the draft, I would, mine would be they use one of those first picks in the top 100 on a lineman, whether it's a interior or a tackle prospect, just because, like, like you said, that Brad Holmes said, you know, we're going to continue to pour assets essentially into the offensive line. I believe that man. Yeah. I'm not, I believe him. I do so. too. But, it, <laughs> but I'm just, I guess what I'm trying to like highlight though is not re-signing Jonah Jackson is a significant risk. Yeah, for sure. Like yeah. I, I agree with Ryan. Like if they go that route, they're going to probably sign some veteran to a one or two year deal. I don't have a guy in mind. We'll, we'll probably talk about that in our free agency podcast. Um, but that's going to be a band-aid and we don't know if it's going to be a good band-aid or not. And it's, it's just, it, it's that insurance in case you don't hit your guys and available on draft day or, or, or whatever. And, and even like, even if you do draft the guy you want, are we talking about starting him on day one? I know offensive linemen tend to be okay in year one, but it's probably going to be the, the weak link on the offensive line, no matter who you get there. And so like, there's, I, I guess my, my overall point is there's, there's a chance for a little bit of regression on the offensive line in 2024. And that, that can be a little scary considering how important it was to their success over the past two years. Yeah, that, that that's for sure. I, I, I think two things. One, just because Colby might not be ready to step up in that spot and be the, you know, uh, emergency plan or kind of the safety net for the guard position this year doesn't mean that that pick is a bust by any means. Cause I don't sure. want people to ru run and say, Oh, Colby's not ready to do this. He got drafted last year. He got experience, you know, in the preseason, he got experience in season, you know, stepping in and, and playing guard that uh, that's neither here nor there. That guy was making a transition from tackle to guard. Yep. Right. And he was also ramping up his level of play, you know, playing at William and Mary to, to, you know, where he, where he is now in the NFL, that's going to take time. Yep. And, Jonah Jackson, though, I, I agree. There's a there's a certain measured amount of risk. However, Jeremy, if we're talking about like 15, 14, 15, 16 million dollars for a guard, the concern with Jonah is I know that his play can be at a high level. There are some legitimate injury concerns. Yeah. And there there are some legitimate concerns when it comes to <clears throat> sometimes his ability at the second level. Like, I, I think that there's some really good stuff that you see, and then there's some stuff where it's like, hmm. Like, it, it kind of takes me back to Ben Johnson talking about, hey, our offensive line is doing a great job. Our running backs are are doing a good job, but they could be doing a better job, right? They're, they're leaving yards out on the field. I think that there's some th – there were some instances last season where I felt that way with Jonah and his mm. blocking um, that, that made me – that it, it – it, it, to be honest, it was the Cowboys game. Like the Cowboys game was a, was a big one where it was like, yeah. Jonah's having a really rough night. And it's like, I, I don't want to say it's make or break for a contract here, but I'm saying that there were enough instances. There were enough injuries last season where it's like, there's a, there's a measured amount of risk by re-signing the guy, yeah. right? Just as much as sure. there is letting the guy walk and trying to, and trying to figure it out. That, and that, that kind of represents the the challenge that we've been talking about that has been coming for Brad Holmes for a while is when when you have a talented roster and you're you know you have some of these contract extensions that, that you're gonna owe down the line you're gonna have to make some tough decisions on talented players guys that can start in this league Jonah Jonah is an above average starter in this league 
I don't I don't think either of you would disagree there. But can you fit him when you're when you're playing Tetris with your salary cap like this? Is is he gonna fit? And and I don't know. It's it's a really hard decision. I, I feel like I feel like most Lions fans have already moved on. I'm not quite there it just because I I'm I'm not ready to let go of a of a good player at a, at a very important position to this offense, but I recognize that it's a very difficult decision. All right. Yeah, I get it too. I liked your Tetris point too, Jeremy. I was thinking about the way Brad Holmes is probably looking at this and mm-hmm. you're you're paying you're gonna pay Panay a ton. Frank's still expensive. Decker, like if he's you know, he's always talked about his job is to think about like the future. And if you draft someone like a Jackson Powers Johnson or a you know a day one or day two pick here, they start this year and then eventually that player moves to another position and then by maybe year three Colby's ready to play sure. at left guard and then then you have a really cheap left guard for two years and that's where if Brad Holmes wants to continue to be executive of the year material <laughs> like if he keeps hitting those man then yeah. his train's just going to keep on rolling right so that's the way I was thinking about there yeah for a well and, and that's what you have to think about when you're making decisions like this right it's not just about 2024 it's about 2025 and 2026 especially when you get towards the draft you're not necessarily drafting for immediate impact you're you're drafting to fill holes two three years down the line so uh, I think that's an important point now one more thing before we get to some of the players uh Dan Campbell expressed a lot of confidence in Jameson Williams in his press conference he also talked about Hendon Hooker saying he was uh he was encouraged by Hendon Hooker's, Hooker's progress in, in two months worth of practices but also admitted you know we still don't know what we have in there yet. So let's, let's first talk about Jameson because I think it was either, I think it was Nick Baumgartner who said like, the word on Indy is like lines, lines really think there's a year three jump coming for, for JMO. So um, I'll throw it to you first, Morgan. Are, are you, are you riding the JMO hype train or, or are you still kind of like, all right, I need to see it a little bit more before I start believing in it. No, I'm all the way on like You're in in. the first few rows. Yeah. First few rows. <laughs> the splash the first class yeah I'm, I'm way up there um i saw you just saw enough at the end of the year right like at the end of the regular season through the playoffs um and it was beyond just some of the splash plays right like he was making plays to you know tough catches in traffic uh making people miss in a phone booth yeah. for some extra yards on the sideline man he juked that guy out of his shoes i forget what game that was um just he made enough plays where you see it, right? And Ben Johnson's going to have a whole summer to cook up ways to get him the ball in, you know, diabolical spaces where he's going to be, you know, that touchdown against the Niners, he was tripping for like half the half the time he was running. <laughs> yeah. And he still was running people. So now I'm all the way on. Um, what about you, Ryan? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I think the idea of Jamison Williams performing and meeting expectations next season uh, I think it's all across the board, though. I think different fans have different ideas of what that looks like and what that means, right? And I think we've talked about it here and there a little bit in terms of, well, what would those numbers look like if Jameson Williams is really, you know, ready to rip and really, like, fulfilling those, you know, expectations that came with being the 12th overall pick that Brad Holmes moved heaven and earth to move up and grab. I mean, to me, though, that, I mean, that, look, that might look like 62 catches, it might look like 62 catches at, you know, 14.5 yards a catch, <laughs> right? Right. Like, and, and that's totally fine. Right. It, it's, it's the impact. It's the, it's the explosive plays. If you can get one of those a game, my goodness, like that, uh, that's worth its weight in gold in the NFL. We know what, you know, how big those splash plays matter, especially, you know, with the Lions your running game last year, right? Like look, look at all the ways that they made big explosive plays like that. The Lions don't have a guy in their wide receiver room like that. Yeah. We love Amon Ross St. Brown. We just got done talking about how he deserves 26 to $28 million a year. We're not looking at Amon Ra who has the ability to make like the play that, you know, Morgan said, I, I think that NFC championship game, that play on the, on the first touchdown he scored was one of those plays where it's like, at two or three points, I thought he was down. Yeah. At two or three points, I was like, man, that's an awesome chunk play for 20-something yards. Oh, that wait, hold on. This is a really good play for thir- – oh, my God, it's a touchdown, <laughs> right? Like, I, I don't know who else on in that wide receiver room is making a play like that no, because no of their, their pure athleticism. So, Jeremy, like, I guess my, my thing to you is 
you know, we were really concerned heading into last off season with JMO. Like our, our concern level was, I mean, we were talking to, you know, his, his, his wide receiver coaches, right. That he works yeah. with in, in, in the off season. Um, how much less concern do you have and how much higher have you raised the expectations for JMO going into year three now? It's, it's a good question because I would say my concern level is significantly down. Like I, I you know, I'm not I'm not going to beat around the bush. Midway through the season, when when he came back after his suspension and and struggled in those first three, four, five, six games, my concern level was pretty high. Um, I thought he had had enough time with with Jared Goff in the off season and all that um, to think that he should have caught on by now, right? Um, and and listen, like I, I definitely adhere to the whole Dan Campbell. Like some sometimes it takes certain players longer to acclimate to the NFL than others. But when you draft a guy 12th overall and trade up to get him, it was just like you, you, you get a shorter, uh, a runway in general. Um, but he really, and, and Morgan nailed it right at the top. Like it wasn't just the big plays. He was making contested catches. He was not dropping the ball. There's still a little bit of a tracking issue in terms of deep balls that, that, that persist. And I do think there's a little, like, I'm not ready to be like, okay, he is a 1200 yards, season type of guy and, and 15 touchdown type of guy. No, I think my bar is a little bit lower than that, but I think, I think, well, I know that the lines view him now as a starter. Like that's, that's going to be his role. He's going to start playing 80, 90% of snaps instead of 50, 60% of snaps going forward. And again, I don't like, I don't know if he's going to be a, a, a six catch a, a game type of guy, but if he's that explosive, like one or two explosives per game, and, and, and just getting more looks, too. Like, I remember Amon Ra, like, once he started to really take on in the first half, in the second half of his first year, he was not only effective as, you know, a possession catcher, as a guy who was going to get 10 targets a game, but then he started taking attention away from other people. They started using him as a decoy. Um, that's what I can see the line starting to do with JMO because we're seeing some of these end arounds, we're seeing some of these deep shots. What happens when they start developing counters to those plays plays that look like those plays um that that to me is something that's very intriguing because they do have a lot of other guys on this team capable of making plays and that's where i think we're headed now with hendon hooker mm. the question is what do the lions view him as are they is he for sure their backup quarterback now that teddy bridgewater is gone now that um uh dave blau was gone what do they is is are, are you guys like, obviously your level of confidence in in your prediction of, of where he's at is, is has to be relatively low because we haven't seen him, but I guess, are you comfortable if the Lions just go in, they grab Nate Sudfeld as QB three and there you go. That's, that's your three quarterbacks going into 2024. Uh, I guess I mean, you know, like, <laughs> we just we just don't really have enough to go off of. I, I'm going to trust, the, you know, the staff. Like, I guess they'll get a good look, you know, once camp gets rolling. And like if I think we'll if they do go and try to sign a, a proven veteran, that probably signals like, OK, you know, Hendon might need a little bit longer to, you know, fully grasp this offense or, you know, whatever the factor is. But I'm hoping, I mean, cause that was a, that was a third round pick too. So I'm hoping he's ready to be the backup this year because right. The, the draft, I hate to say that, but where he was drafted, that kind of plays a part, right? Yeah, it, it plays a part for sure. Morgan, I think the other thing to factor in is, and I'm not trying to uh, commit some revisionist history because I was about as out as anybody could have been on Hendon Hooker through the pre-draft process and leading up to the draft. And it was like the idea of, I mean, how could the lions spend valuable draft capital on a guy who's 25 on a guy who isn't going to play his, you know, rookie season at all whatsoever. But to that point, he was a third round pick because of the age, because of the injury. And if had Hendon hooker been 22 years old, might not have even been available in the third round for the Lions to take, right? Like, you know, doesn't tear that ACL. You might have been talking about a guy who could have been a first-round pick. I mean, he was a front-runner for the Heisman on an SEC team. I and mean, those don't grow on trees. And, and we've seen some of the tape. I would be a little bit concerned if the Lions didn't feel comfortable enough having him be the backup quarterback because 
he got last season with Teddy Bridgewater. Yeah. Like he, like, I, I feel like he was just in this ecosystem, Jeremy, that if, if that's not going to help you swim in this league, I, I'm wondering what will, because you got Ben Johnson, you got Jared Goff, you got Teddy Bridgewater. You, you have this incredible support system. I understand you didn't get a ton of reps, right? Like, I, I mean, it, it, it was a wash of a rookie season. Um, I, I would just have some reservations because of the, the investment and because of, I mean, now it's kind of time to, it's, it's time to show out. It's time to shine. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's a little like, I'm, I'm not a guy who, who wrings his hands over the backup quarterback situation. Cause in general, you, you get to your backup quarterback, your season's probably in, in significant trouble anyways. Um, but I, I think there is a certain amount of anxiety that I have in terms of a guy who hasn't played at the NFL level, either exhibition or otherwise that, that has had the bolts flying, as they like to say, even in like, even in practice, I think in this quote that from, from Dan Campbell or Brad Holmes, I can't even remember who it was. He's like, yeah, he, you know, he got, he got a couple of reps with the ones <laughs> like that's it. Uh, and so I really need, I really need to see at least a training camp with this guy before I'm like, Oh yeah, we're good. It's fine. Um, but at the same time, like, I think you guys are absolutely right. I, the the third round investment tells me that they thought this guy had a lot of value and probably, I mean, obviously not right away, but pretty quickly. And and maybe the age plays in his favor in terms of being able to learn quickly in, in terms of being a professional. And, and you're right that the signing of Teddy Bridgewater very much had to do with taking him along in his rookie season. But I mean, how much guidance does he get when he was only on the field for two months? <laughs> not, not a ton. So I don't know. It, it, it's a fascinating situation to look. It's not something, like I said, I'm going to be, it's going to be keeping me up at night, but um, I'm, it, it's, it's intriguing. I think, I think the lines would be wise to at least get a seasoned veteran in that room. doesn't have to be a guy that can light the world on fire when he's out, out there on the field, but is going to be another valuable resource to Hendon Hooker. And, and I know some people think you, you overplay that hand a little bit. Like you have quarterbacks coach, you have an assistant quarterbacks coach. Yeah. But it also helps to have a guy who's there in the locker room with him, showing him how to go about his day to day business as well. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's it's whatever, but I'm 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 hopeful. I'm hopeful for Hendon Hooker, and and I'm maybe maybe more so than anyone else. At least right now, he might be the guy I'm most interested in seeing in in practice going forward this off season. Yeah, yeah, and I think the one last thing I want to mention though is, and 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 you touched on this a little bit, but the the idea that at an advanced age, you maybe don't have so much of a concern if he has to step in and play, right? Because I, I think I think going into this season and having a veteran quarterback, well, first of all, you're talking about, are the Lions going to carry three quarterbacks on their roster? Because um, that's an interesting discussion to have if you're going to have another veteran guy, if it, sure. Nate Sudfeld, right? If Nate Sudfeld is going to be on the roster, uh, you know, is is it's part of the roster construction calculus, right? But then the other thing is, I mean, this isn't, it's not a it's not a 21 year old that you're like okay you're the backup quarterback right we you know we got you in the third round and we kind of view you as I I'm just really fascinated this offseason to figure out why do the Lions value Hendon Hooker right did did they value him because hey people love quarterbacks people need quarterbacks are always searching for them for the most part right like if you don't have one you're looking for one if they can get one in the door in the third round and view him as an asset rather than something, you know, uh, you know, someone that they're going to play. I, I don't know. I think that that's just fascinating to figure out this off season while we're waiting on a Jared Goff extension, while we're, you know, trying to make sense of is Hendon Hooker, the backup quarterback. Is he the quarterback of the future? Is he what, what is, what is Hendon Hooker? So it, it, it's a really interesting subplot, I think to this off season. You know what else is interesting? Meat. Meat is very interesting. And this is a good time to remind everyone that the Pride of Detroit podcast is brought to you by Righteous Felon Craft Jerky. It's the jerky that fuels your Detroit Lions. It's going to be part of Hendon Hooker's offseason regimen. Make sure you get all your protein only from Righteous Fel Felon Beef Jerky. That's right. Because I don't know if you guys knew this, but each two ounce bag, like the one I'm currently holding, the Biltong Darth Garlic, two ounce bag. 16 to 20 grams of protein packed into it. Let me see exactly. 16. 
And that, no, 32, because this is 16 per serving size. That is that right? That doesn't even seem right. That's craziness. And only, that's how good it is. That's how good it is. And only 80 calories. I'm telling you guys, if, you, if you're looking for high-protein, low-calorie snacks, just down one of these bags a, a day, and you're done. You got all the protein you need. If it's good enough for the Lions, it's good enough for you. It's good enough for Jonah. I mean, Jonah Jackson's going to be able to pay for a lot of these, especially if he uses our discount coupon code. But we'll get to that in a second. Because Righteous Felon is based in Westchester, Pennsylvania. They use locally sourced, all-natural black Angus beef, and they pride themselves on superior quality, revolutionary branding, and in my favorite, the unique flavors. I'm telling you, this Darth Garlic stuff is sick. Uh, you can go, and, and, and like I said, Jonah Jackson, I'm on Rob, before you get paid, if, if, you're look, if you're looking to snack on a budget, go to RighteousFelon.com and use the code... P-O-D-15, as in Pride of Detroit, 15% off. Because, yes, that'll get you 15% off your order. And this isn't one of those, like, eh, it's only an introductory code. Like, you, you can't have an account. This is only your first. No. Use it in perpetuity. I'm using Spam big it. words. Spam it. Use it now. And when you, you eat all your beef jerky and you're like, dang, that was that was as good as Jeremy was telling me. Go use P-O-D-15 again. Keep using it over and over and over and over again. You'll never you'll never have to pay full price. You're cheating the system. <laughs> when we come back on the Pride of Drake podcast, we're finally going to talk about the actual prospects down in Indianapolis, the guys who impressed us on offense, the guys who impressed us on defense, and no one at all impressed us on special teams because they don't even televise the special teams parts. I don't even know if that's true. Someone made a 60-yarder. I guess that was fun. Anyways, we'll be right back on the POD cast. All right. We're on break. What's up, everybody? That was a long segment. 30-some minutes. About 30 minutes. Yeah, I guess I was foolish because I was putting the run down together. That's true. Someone made a... Whoops. Sorry, I just opened the YouTube stream, which has the wrong name. So I'm going to change that now. <laughs> What's up, YouTube? What's up, everybody? How are we feeling on a uh, a brisk early oh, March? Gosh. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful day. It puts me in the mood. It puts me in the mood. It feels, it feels like... Summer break is right around the corner, and we'll be that much closer to football. How far is summer break? Middle May, May, June. Uh, we get out the second week of June, okay. so which isn't it's bad. Far. Mm-mm. Oh no! All right, let me. Eighty-five put... million in dead cap, man. That is... <laughs> do Do we want to talk a little Russell Wilson? Oh boy. That is some crazy stuff, man. I haven't looked. Is it just for this year or is that the totality? No, it's probably just for this year, I bet, because it's more. I I thought I saw Albright saying they're gonna try to they're gonna be able to spread it out. I don't I don't understand why though. Yeah, why not just eat it? I I thought I read somewhere like was it is it uh, they're officially releasing him like post post some date in March because that'll allow them to spread it out over two years. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. know. Sean Payton just doesn't want to suck. Whatever. Can I was talking about this with my buddy. Like I'm having a really hard time squaring the fact that I personally don't like Sean Payton, but Dan Campbell loves him. Yeah. What is, what is he seeing him? It's like it's like when your friend is dating someone who you hate. It's like what? How do I? What, how, do, you see, what do you see in that guy? How do I tell they Dan wanna, Campbell that that Sean Payton isn't right for him? They want a bajillion <laughs> games in New Orleans. That's the only thing, right? Like they want a bajillion games, man. Every year, like 11, 12, 13 wins. But yeah, he's not a can't be a good guy, right? I don't think it's so. Like Greg Williams. Greg Williams is a turd, like certified. <laughs> right? Is he still in the NFL? I hope not. It's a good question. I don't, I don't think so. He better he be, could a, be. Uh, 
He better be with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, someone else taking shots at the CFL. Let's go. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Who else did last time? You, Jeremy? Oh, yeah, I'm always the guy. <laughs> Three downs, get out of here. You've offended John and Hamza so far this podcast <laughs> with the, the special team stock. That's what I'm here for. Oh, it's okay. I hate special teams too. I tweet. I hate kickers probably like four or five times per regular season. <clears throat> you know how I can tell that like I'm so. I don't want to say out of touch, and I also don't want to say counterculture, but like. I I actually like the new kickoff rule. <laughs> like, I, it feels like it feels like all the special teamers hate it. Um. I th- I thought I hated it when I first heard it, but that was only because Albert Breer reported it wrong originally when he said they were going to kick off from the opponent's 40-yard line, which is not true. <laughs> because from the no. opponent, like, you, you're just, like, squibbing it from there on. It's yeah. back at the 35, but everyone else is up at the at the 40 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Which, like, I'm, like, the XFL did it, and it seemed good enough, and it gets at the main problem of a, of, of the kickoffs, which is people running halfway down the field and colliding into other people. I think, mm-hmm. I think, I think the pro I think the reason there's such an adverse reaction to it is, is that it's drastically different and people don't yeah, want people, people, hate people hate big changes, but yeah. this, I mean, this is a big problem that required a big change and it required to me one, one of two changes, getting rid of it or something like this. Because there, there, there is no squaring no in between. There, yeah, right. Yeah. There is no making the the play safe while increasing returns, unless you were going to do something this drastic. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's yeah. to me, it's just silly that they putzed around with this for so long. Like they <laughs> they changed the all these rules to incentivize touchbacks, and then they're like, "There's too many touchbacks." <laughs> I thought you were trying to do that. You're trying, like, if you want to make football safer more touchbacks is is one way to do it i thought that's what you were trying to do and now it's like no we didn't want that many okay well now if you don't want that many the game's gonna be less safe unless you do this and then i understand like i've already seen some people throw out the like oh if you're trying to make the game safe why are you trying to move to 18 games well i mean it's it's an entirely different topic you're right but they're trying to move to 18 games because it's going to make them a lot more money Exactly. Changing yeah. the kickoff doesn't change how much money they're going to make. You can no. you can make the the kickoff safer without being without being completely hypocritical that you're making an 18th game. Yeah. When just when are we going to get what what is it fourth and fifteen from? Yeah, the onside your, kick. What, your 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 own is it is it fourth and fifteen from your own twenty five? Something like that. Yeah. That's not hard enough. I don't like that. That scares the sh- you know what out of me, bro. No, no, no. I don't like that. I'm a little scared of that too, to be honest. Only because defensive penalties. That's it. Yep. Like the fact that you can re- you can recover an onside kick with a illegal yes. hands to the face or something like that, yeah. or a stupid DPI like six right. yards down the field. Like no, 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 no. Not before they change that rule. <laughs> My hot take on special teams is just get rid of kickers and have your most. Your best position player, try kicking. Like, I want to see Panay Sewell kick. Like, remember when Sue kicked that extra point? You guys want to make kick. That would be fun. All right? That would be fun. Let's just do that. I hate kickers. Yeah. Punters are fine. (laughs) Nah. Punters are worse. My hot take is to get rid of punts. Yeah. That, that, and, and I admit that changes the game entirely, but I think it changes it for the better. What would you just have quarterbacks arm punt? No, you just, just not count it as an just you have to go for it every time. Oh no, you're 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 a madman. Yeah, <laughs> why not, Jared? Games <laughs> become more high scoring. I just like, oh my I, God. the way I've always put it is that to me it's so weird to me that for one play every every series we just throw a whole bunch of guys out there who don't play normally to play to do one thing to kick or return a kick. Just wh- why? Like why? You have a team. You have your best players on the team. Why is there one yeah. down devoted to these backups? These weird specialized backups. It's archaic to an extent, for sure. I mean, we could, you know, I don't know. I, yeah. I, the only reason I don't hate punters as much, and I'm sure they, you know, their job's way easier. Like, well, let's just keep it a, you know, 
once in a while you have like a stressful punt and you know what yeah. man i've seen too many of our punters shank a stressful punt sure you know i'm like man but i do like jack fox at least he can throw the ball and stuff too that's fun <laughs> but. i get like i get that no one's ready ready for this conversation of getting rid of punting no one's ready for it no one most people won't ever be ready for it they're too scared i get it give me a solution it'll it'll increase going for it but give me a solution to at least punt it like i'm on my own three all right don't don't get backed up at your own three morgan oh man (laughs) Uh, it's an offensive league you should be able to finish this uh, you know what this would get rid of this would get rid of the annoying third and 20 draw play give ups. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It yeah, would get rid of true. the the New York Giants running it on third and nine from their own two yard line. <laughs> remember remember that? Yeah. yeah, it was because Tommy DeVito was <laughs> terrible in his first game. <laughs> yes, that was bad. Uh, that was oh my god, surrender play. There there there's definitely part of me, Jeremy, though, that like you're definitely upsetting like 14 year old me because I mean when you're talking about those Madden drills, <laughs> coffin corner, like <laughs> I mean coffin corner was one of my favorite drills. <laughs> I mean, just fire up Madden yeah. 13 if you ever get that itch. <laughs> I think you got to go back further, which is the crazy thing. Probably. <clears throat> you know, maybe this all comes like from a deep-seated like scarring from Devin Hester. Can you hear my cat? The one at all? Can you hear him at all? I don't okay, think so. Cat, I'm just making sure. He's an idiot. No. Yeah, okay, just making sure. Is Devin uh, Hester. I he, maybe he scarred me so much. In in my uh, in my youth you that now, punt. yeah. Okay. I mean, when's the last time the Lions like had a truly dynamic punt returner? Like Khalif is good, right now, Ron but Ron he's Ron not Ron. really good. No, he's not. He's yeah. not the same. Jeremy Ross. <laughs> uh, legit, <laughs> le- legitimately, he was a Pro Bowler. Probably Eddie Drummond. Drummond. Uh, you know, Ag- Agnew is actually not a bad answer either. So maybe maybe it's been more common here than I thought. Agnew, he made a career for himself. Yeah. He, you Jeremy, know, he, Jeremy Ross, right? Jeremy Ross, the yeah. snow, snow game. Okay, just yeah. made sure oh, I yeah. make it. Yeah, we don't. I've oh, already, no, that, yeah. that okay. snow game has already been referenced <laughs> once today, Morgan. Yeah, sorry, we're getting that out Thanks, sorry, Jason sorry, sorry. Kelsey, who called it oh, the God. most fun game he's ever played in. Wow, dude, I was so mad at the end of that. Fun game. is a very relative term. It sure is. <laughs> It's like he was the uh, LaShawn McCoy was the only one who wore the right cleats. That's the whole that's that's the that you can summarize the game that way. <laughs> LaShawn McCoy, only person in the entire stadium to have the right cleats on. Oh man. I just but yeah, I was watching that game okay. in Florida and like the Lions were still very much in a playoff race at that point. 2013. Yeah. And probably should have made the playoffs. And I argued they would have made the playoffs if they had won that game, but it kind of sent them spiraling. You and me are all. I want. I want everything. I'm. I think you guys are all in the same. But I would like every game to have the option to be played indoors. No option. It should be indoors. Agreed. Yeah. But like, grow grass indoors. Figure it out, NFL. Yeah, you got a zillion dollars. Figure it out, man. I don't care. But yeah, I'm right <laughs> there with you. Like, I, people are like, "Oh, this is fun." I'm like, "It's fun when it's like a Thursday night MAC game and like the competition's not good anyway." Yeah. But when I'm watching like the best, I want to watch them in their premium conditions. I'm not trying to see them slip sliding around like me and my drunk uncle on Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I'm not saying that. Like, that's not it. Slip have, sliding away. We have never been yeah, so yeah. in tune, Morgan. Yeah, man. I don't want to see that. I, I'm like, come on. But that's another that's another one that gets the the traditional football lovers in a tizzy. Oh, they, the they don't like that take. Yeah. We're just trying. We're <laughs> we're just trying to make the game game better all right just because it's different doesn't mean it's worse i feel like if you think that then your nfl team hasn't lost the game like the blizzard game (laughs) you know like that is definitely a deep scar game too yeah you lose in a monsoon or a blizzard or something like that you're like screw this man i'm done domes (laughs) yeah like the miami dolphins probably feel like that after just getting wiped by the chiefs in a sub wasn't it like below zero in that game or something? The playoff game? Yeah, and then all those years of going to Foxborough and getting their asses beat 
Yeah. You know, like in the snow. So yeah, that's all. I'm sure. I'm sure the Dolphins are on that tip. <clears throat> oh man, Peyton Manning would have loved every game to have been played in a dome. That's oh, for sure. True. Yeah. That was... <laughs> so a Jared. <laughs> Jared would be for that for sure. I'm just kind of upset because um, somebody who I don't mind on Twitter because I think that they're ultimately just having a good time, but they uh, they retweeted. They retweeted this tweet, this graphic of um, a certain account saying 30 minutes to the Super Bowl for the Lions with the halftime score. Mm-mm-mm. And it kind of like changed my my whole mood. Right now? Yeah. Yeah. Like I saw it at the beginning of break and like I'm just kind of been stewing over it. Like you guys got all fired up about special teams and it's like, oh, what Who a cool it? tweet to see. Who is it? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Who is it, man? <laughs> was it a reef? I bet it was a reef. It was wasn't a reef. Who's <laughs> no, just... messing with us on this fine Monday evening? Mm. Who's it? Who is it? Put them out there. You don't have to. Twitch chat. You don't have to. Do some digging. You don't have to. <laughs> it was a Twitch PFF. Chat, it, it, it was a PFF tweet that got retweeted, but. Okay. Dang, they oh. tweeted that out. Yes. During the game. During the game. 8, 12 p.m. Mm, rude. I was at a friend's house mm-hmm. to watch that game uh, mm-hmm. that we sit with for our season tickets and. It was good, but then, like, one of my friends said something like, oh, they're cooked. And I was like, yo, go find some wood and start knocking your head against it. <laughs> like, because, like, this is, what are you talking about here? Like, but yeah, I'll, uh, makes me want to watch games like that in a bubble, which I probably will next year. Thanks for bringing that up, Ryan. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, let me get to some alerts here. Then we'll, we'll talk about anything else. <laughs> Um, Mick Spearman, they give the 18 month subscribe on Twitch says, let the post combine mock drafts commence. No, <laughs> wait, wait two weeks. That's just wait, wait for free agency to happen. Yeah, please. Even just the first wave of free agency. That said, if anyone on pride trade wants to write a mock draft, <laughs> I will gladly take the clicks. <laughs> Uh, Brennan, thank you for the 41 month subscribe channel. Says one week from legal tampering. It's true. Is it noon? I think it's noon. It's either noon or four o'clock next Monday. I think it's noon. I'll just double check. <clears throat> a quarter. 19 month subscribe channel. Says let's go draft in Detroit, baby. Yeah, we are, what, a month? Month and change away? Two months? Just under two months? <clears throat> Very close. The wheels are a churning, hopefully. <laughs> Morgan. <laughs> Morgan not looking too confident over there. Uh Uncle Indigo oh. 46 months subscribed to the channel says Chris looks different. Which one is Chris? Is Morgan Chris? I guess Mor- Morgan is in Chris's spot on the screen. But it says Morgan though, right? It does. Okay. Is Morgan Perfett. Morgan Perfett. Uh, zero Slub. Why Why does that gate name look new to me? Did you change your name? Six months subscribed to the channel. Thank you so much. RGA, 17 months, says Go Loins. And he's quoting Chris. Thank you for the, the Chris tribute. Uh, Nem Loin. <laughs> How am I supposed to say that? NEM. You did not? Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I guess I'm still getting used to like the, the first half years. Chris is here or Nem, Nem Loin, N-E-M-L-O-E-N. How am I supposed to pronounce that? Let me know. Nem Loen. Got it. Nem Loen. Thank you for the five months subscribe to the channel. Lamont's Builder, 16 months is excited to see what Brad will do in free agency in the draft. Aren't we all? Whoa. Give me a second. <clears throat> uh, Sundog, the year of the 14 months, says, How did Jeremy's mustache get on Ryan's face? Good question. 
we had a whole talk about it before <laughs> the show. So do do you want to okay. tell the people about it or none of their business? Well, I have a mustache now. Yeah. Um. I just felt like it. Okay. There doesn't. There doesn't, there doesn't always need to be a reason, right? That's right like, yeah. sure. People ask why I have a beard, and I'm like, it's just laziness. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Like this laziness. is going. This is going to like take more upkeep because I have to like trim my face like every day. So. I don't know. It just feels like something to do, like in your mid thirties. <laughs> Oh boy! So this is becoming a midlife thirty, a midlife crisis. This, this you're, is you're the. Uh, than me. You're not mid thirties yet, Ryan. You're younger than me. I'm, in like two months, I think I'm considered close enough to mid thirties. Like I'm on the closer side to mid thirties than I am on it's, early thirties. Is thirty three mid thirties? I think if you're rounding up, right. Oh, that's fair. Damn, I'm mid thirties. All right, never mind. <laughs> oh boy, I'm about to be late. My midlife mustache <laughs> crisis. <laughs> Joshua Mercer, 45 months, says five Twitch babies. I feel like Mike Brady. Is that, is that a Brady Bunch reference? I think it is a Brady Bunch reference. Impressive. Yeah. Uh, Bobbert, thank you for the 32 months subscribed to the channel. Captain James Kirk, 35 months, says coming up on my fourth Twitch baby. Love you guys. Hey, buddy. Love you. Thanks for the support. Uh, Lion in London, 42 months subscribed to the channel, says, please do, please do a mock draft stream. You know you want to. At some point, we will. It was not that long ago in which we did. We had like a, a day devoted to mock drafts, like a mock draft Thursday. I'm not sure if we'll ever get back to that, but we'll do some mock draft streams. And... I should I shouldn't have pluralized it because I can't guarantee it'll be more than one, but we'll do so. <laughs> we'll do at least one. <clears throat> um, and then Joshua Mercer just dropped a five gifted sub bomb. Appreciate that. Yeah, of course. No, we we have to we have to get Eric because he's the only one that has the willpower to learn prospects past the fifth round. Yep. So that. <laughs> When we get to the end of each mock draft, we aren't just like, hey, there's the guy that's top of the draft board. Let's pick him. Hey. Hey. <clears throat> Sorry to all of you that love doing mock drafts and and learn all 200 and whatever. 50, was it 256? Is that right? That doesn't even seem right. It's more than that. Maybe it is. Whatever. Time, man. Yeah. I'm just, I can't do it. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough interest. We go Bang. hard once they're drafted, guys. Exactly. You know, you know, and and to compound that problem, do you know what the problem is this year? It's that the Lions don't draft until twenty nine. So yeah, it's like, dude. what? Like it feels very much like, <clears throat> man, do all that studying for all these players, and it's like, <laughs> a good chunk of them aren't even going to be an option or yeah. an opportunity. Right. Right. No. Whereas, like, at Unless least they in trade years past, up, Ryan. <laughs> careful. That monkey paw will curl, buddy. Don't, don't <laughs> no, say do the things that you don't you don't want to happen. Maybe I do. Maybe I want them to trade all of their day three picks to move up ten spots in the first round. Don't get tough right now. <laughs> don't, get, don't get tough. Maybe I do want that. Don't no. No, no, no. I know you don't. <laughs> I mean, if it literally only costs like fifth and sixth round picks, do it, but that's not really how trading up in the first round works. <laughs> It could if you're working with uh, if you're trading with the Vikings. Maybe. Brad I've, I've, loves to trade you know with what? the Vikings. I've also seen a lot of very unrealistic trades being thrown out there recently, so get yourself a number one corner for a fifth round pick. Why not? People yeah. love to use that trade machine, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't it's just tough for me to like really fall in love with a prospect. I still do it, but then like and you study him a bunch and then he plays for the Bears. Right, you know, like that yeah. would the, piss me off. Yeah, yeah. Then, then then they go and they play for the Titans, and it's like, yeah, I don't watch any, I don't again. watch any yeah. Titans games. No, they they reappear like twenty twenty nine when their rookie deals up, and they you know, <laughs> yeah, make their way somewhere else. But yeah, that's yeah. 
I mean, the, the, that's a good point about 29. It feels less stressful to me than other years, but I don't know. Just because they're picking so late. Yeah. Uh, Miko, hey, what's up, buddy? Thank you for the 27 month subscribe to the channel. Says, what do we think the reaction will be if the pick at 29 is a wide receiver? Overwhelming support, I'm sure. Well, first of all, Miko, I hope you're doing all right. Uh, second of all, I'm on board. Like, I don't know if fully on board is the right way to phrase it, but I'm I'm definitely on board. And obviously a lot is going to depend on what they do in free agency. Like, if they go into the draft without a clear number one corner, yeah, the reaction's going to be bad, right? Like, people are going to be pissed that they're not spending it on defense. But with, with the future of JMO unknown, even if they re-sign Josh Reynolds, it's only going to be do a, like a one or two year deal. Wide receiver is a is a non insignificant need. I probably just could have said significant instead of double negative to myself there, but I'm I'm not here I'm not here to check anybody right now. <laughs> like if we're we... gonna talk we're gonna talk about wide receivers maybe at 29 in this next segment. Are we? Oh, you did. Okay, you filled it out. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Let's talk wide receivers. Um, I don't, you know what? I, I'm kind of interested. So like, that's our ideas, but like, I'm going to put a poll up on Twitch. You got two minutes to vote. Are you cool with the wide receiver at 29? <clears throat> uh, Joshua Mercer, 100 bit says Ryan quit on mock drafts after Malik Willis. <laughs> I don't think that was the... I don't think that was the cause, and that's not true because I did a lot of mock drafts last year. You did, actually, for the site. You and Eric teamed up a couple times. We did. And I remember being on my back deck and being like, I don't know, like, Eric, what if they draft Jameer Gibbs? He's like, he could go in the first round. Boy, did he. Boy, did he. What y'all don't know is Jeremy actually does a ton of mock drafts in his free time, just like just for, just for just for giggles, but he doesn't talk about it. So that's, a, that's a, what really. So wait, about. how would you know if I don't talk about it? You talk it to us in Slack, oh. but you're like, I'm not about to. You know, you're like, oh so, my god, I'm going crazy with this trade that, machine. But that that means that Morgan's breaking the one rule of Slack, which is what <laughs> happens in Slack stays in Slack. <laughs> Um, <laughs> imagine though if I'm just like that guy that's like here's my mock draft for today every, tags like every single Lions writer on Twitter <laughs> just no, become actually, that he person genuinely hates it. he genuinely hates it I, which is funny. Like, someone asked that in the chat earlier they're like Jeremy do you like really, do you hate draft the draft or you just hate I forget what it was but I was like no nah, he hates it all no 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 here's the thing I love the draft the actual draft I hate everything that comes before it. Right. Hate hate is a strong word, but I just I'm not that interested in talking about it for two, three, four months. I'm not that interested in the NFL combine. I'm not that interested in pro days. Um yeah. and that's why I, I tried to take a different approach to the NFL combine this year where I'm I'm trying to pay more attention to the interviews, which stuff because they don't they like that part isn't live, which I think is no. maybe one of the more important parts of the entire weekend. But like I, what I did was, you know, a lot of these guys will talk to the meet. It's it's basically like Radio Row there at the combine, much like the Super Bowl, where there's these booths of different shows and radio. Like, so a lot of these prospects will go and talk with them for ten minutes. So like, I jumped around and I walked. I I, I watched a couple uh, Rake Straw interviews and I watched a couple Darius Robinson interviews and and Shop Robinson interviews just to kind of like get to know these players as people because. To me, that's like the character evaluation is so important. <clears throat> I can read yeah. numbers. I can I can look and see. Ooh, green, good. Red, bad. Like <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. <clears throat> True. Oof, Miko, that sounds horrible. <laughs> um, what else? We're, I feel like we were just talking about something. Maybe. <laughs> jo- talking jo- about mock drafts. Oh, right. oh, uh, wide receivers at twenty nine. The poll finished. I missed it. <laughs> it was it was close to fifty fifty. I don't know how to yeah, pull it up. I, th- I think it was I think it was fifty five percent. Okay. 
Yes. So that they were cool with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Josh Armstrong says, Jeremy, do you take a kicker in the draft? I'm of the belief that once you get to the sixth round, I don't care what position you take, including kicker. Yeah. Including long snapper. Shout out Jimmy Landis. Shout no. out Jimmy Landis. <laughs> Not Jimmy Landis. No, but I mean, like, when you're talking about sixth and seventh rounders in general, you're talking about guys that you hope can contribute on special teams. Guess what? Kicker contributes on special teams. I The thing is, like, the hit rate on drafting kickers is also incredibly, incredibly low. So if the Lions draft one or get one as a UDFA or get a free agent, I really don't care. They, they need to add somebody, and they will. So yeah. if it's a six-rounder, cool. If it's a seven-rounder, cool. Free agent, cool. Just get the right guy. Nothing what the nothing what the Niners did though. That would have me freaking out. What, was Moody a third or fourth? Third. Pick Funny. was it ninety nine? Right. So he was in the top one hundred. Oh, do four then. Okay, but yeah, geez. I Don't do that. Third. No. <clears throat> um. He was a compensatory pick. I need to. Oh, I need to take that uh, channel point redemption off. Unless you have a bookshelf here uh not really okay i mean no yeah sorry whoops sorry stranger i'll refund your money here do you know what we can talk about instead real quick what's that or do you have more alerts to go through uh n- ro- yes robo 1207 thank you for the 32 months says let's go march on Lattimore to detroit that one's complicated i've been trying to read up on the contract because it's a really weird one where Someone kind of erroneously reported this week that like, oh, his his cap hit or his salary this year is only like one point three million, and it's super affordable for the team that trades for him. But there's an option bonus that triggers right before the season that really that sh- shoots it up, and and the way I don't know, it, it's there's an over the cap article on it. But long story short, the Saints aren't going to trade him until after June first, so that makes it weird. In, like, negotiating like you, free agency? You, yeah, like, how do you plan for something that you're hoping to happen in, right like three months? And, like, yes, you can theoretically come to terms on a trade. But you obviously can't include 2024 draft picks in it. You can't trade a 2023 third-round pick or fifth-round pick for, for Marshawn Lanimore because the trade can't be... They, as soon as you make that trade... You, you can't you can't like do a post June first trade and actually have it happen because as soon as it happens it, it happens it's not like the cut yeah. thing so anyways you'd have to trade future assets you'd have to come to an agreement and just like be like okay don't go back on your word <laughs> which <clears throat> probably wouldn't happen but I don't know it's it's an interesting situation and I wouldn't be completely against it because. The way, the way I looked at it, too, like, Marshawn has really big salaries beyond 2023. It's beyond 2024. I'm, I'm playing from a, a, a year behind. Um, but you, the, if, if you exercise the option or don't exercise the option as after you trade for him, there's no, like, you take a, a, a pretty significant cap hit this year, but those salaries that are in the future – are non-guaranteed. You don't have any guaranteed money left on the contract. So if 2024 doesn't work out, even though he's doing $19 million salary in 2025, you can get out of that contract basically for free. So it's an interesting idea and I'm not completely against it. It's just the logistics of are, are going to be weird because <clears throat> you're probably going to have to agree to terms with it in the next month or two, but not be able to consummate the, the trade until after June, which is, you know, you're going to miss OTAs. You're going to miss mini camp. You're going to miss, a lot of things and a veteran like Lattimore doesn't necessarily need it, but um, it, the, and the one thing I, I don't know is like, can you announce that? Can you, cause a lot of times you'll see these two teams have agreed to terms for with a trader. These, this team has agreed to terms with a, a contract. I don't know if like that would leak to the media. If you'd be like the lions and the saints have agreed to terms to trade Marshawn Lattimore for a fifth round pick. 
but it's not going to happen until June. I I, I've never seen that happen, I don't think, and I don't know if it would or wouldn't. I'm trying to remember if that was part of the Aaron Rodgers drama last off season. Oh, I right. felt like that. I felt like maybe I'm misremembering that, but I feel like the lead up to the draft, there was something that kind of felt like that. It's a weird one. It is definitely weird. Uh, the Pintar. Wanna... Sorry, one more alert. The Pintar, thank you for the 13 months. Says knock, knock. Who's there? Brad Holmes. Brad Holmes who? Let me in. I'm Brad Holmes. I'm the world's greatest GM. Come on in, Brad Holmes. <laughs> Make yourself at home. Uh, um, don't stare at me like that. Um, should we go segment two? Just because it is almost 7.30? Probably. Should we talk about how... Justin Fields is probably going to get traded. <laughs> Certainly seems like it's trending that direction, right? Yeah. Nothing broke today. I was off line. No, nothing yet. Nothing, nothing today, but over the weekend there was uh, Rusini, right? Yeah. Uh, Rusini put it out there that I think it's pretty much understood that like they're figuring out where <laughs> they're going to send him. Honestly, good. Dude, that's how I feel, and I know that, like, I don't know. I put that out there on Twitter where I was like, I would love to see the Bears hit reset again. Like, yes. especially on a guy who, like, in terms of the the traits that people don't love about Justin Fields, they overlap so much with Caleb Williams. Like, mm-hmm. you're starting over at square one. Like, it seems like the alternative, like, I would rather them move on from Justin Fields, make Caleb Williams a number one pick, than the alternative, which would be Ryan Poles gets a absolute treasure trove of draft picks and draft capital to move down for another year in a row where, I don't know, maybe he could make a deal with somebody who might be picking again at number one the following year. Right. And then it's just wash, rinse, and repeat. This like, perpetual motion machine of yeah. getting the first overall pick. Yes, like, yes, awesome. Please move on from Justin Fields, who seems like he was, like, Starting at least to getting close to getting it. Yeah. yeah. Just in time to take a quarterback first round and to steer clear of all that stuff. Because, I mean, what, the alternative might be, oh, they trade back and they get Marvin Harrison Jr. Freaking great. I would love to deal with Marvin Harrison Jr. for 10 years. Yeah. I mean, Lions' number one cornerback is Cam Sutton. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Just going up against him and uh, DJ Justin. Moore. DJ oh Moore. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that division would suddenly be terrible to deal with for a while. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, dude, I don't. I'm happy because as, as goofy as Fields is, like with some of his stuff, like we know what he can do, and it's tough to deal with. Yeah, like, it's yeah. tough to deal with. And Chad is rightfully pointing out, like we probably should have lost twice to the Bears, largely because of Justin Fields. <laughs> I mean, their defense was also playing very well down the stretch, but yeah, I yeah, I, I wrote a whole article about this, and and part of it was the the, the Windy City Grid, Gridiron reached out to me, and they're like, "We're just wondering what other teams want us to do. So can you like put up a poll and just ask what Lions fans want them to do?" And I made it a question of the day, and I think it was like sixty ish, forty ish, in we want the Bears to trade Justin Fields and risk it all on a on a new young quarterback. But like, there are arguments to be made on both sides. But I'm I'm with you in general. Just, it's not a great situation either way. Like the Bears are set up to cash in one way or the other. But it's not easy to draft quarterbacks. And Caleb Williams, to me, is by is is far from a a slam dunk. He's generational talent type of quarterback. I think he's very talented. I think he could be very good. I'm not certain that he is. I don't think they're necessarily putting him in a great position. And I mentioned in the, in the article, like if he doesn't hit the ground running and the bears, I don't know, go six and 11, seven and 10. Are they keeping ever? Are they keeping Eberflus? And if not, if they are overhauling their coaching staff in year two of Caleb Williams, that's you're you're already like you've already failed. You've already failed him. You've already put him in a very bad situation. We can hope. 
Yeah. That'd be beautiful. So, so to that point too, I'm looking it up real quick, but that's an underrated point that you just made, Jeremy, because I'm seeing how many offensive coordinators Justin Fields went through. Um, just in, you know, his, I mean, he's going on what his, he was the same draft as Panay, right? So he's going on year four here. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, offensive coordinator in his rookie year was, uh, you guys remember Bill Lazor? <laughs> barely. <laughs> uh, I get it, barely. Uh, yeah, I mean, Lazor, his rookie year, Getze last year, and then he would be going on his third offensive coordinator in four years if they keep Justin Fields, right? But, I mean, in terms of stability and actually getting, like, players around him, right? Like, yeah. is it any shock that as soon as they got DJ Moore, it's like, oh, maybe Justin Fields has a little bit of something. Like, we had that conversation with Brett Whitefield, right, Jeremy, where it's like, look at Tua. Like, you give him Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, and all of a sudden he's a guy that you can try to talk yourself into being a $50 million right? quarterback. He was, almost, he was almost the MVP last year. Right? <laughs> Which is nuts. And, like, I'm not saying that, like, oh, Justin Fields leaves and Caleb Williams comes here. Here and he's a like Caleb Williams could be just a uh, you know big a pain in the side as Justin Fields was because of his you know athleticism and his ability to extend plays like yeah all that stuff is still going to chap the Lions' ass on defense like 100 percent but like I just like the proposition of them restarting everything if they have a bad year Jeremy and Eber is out the door then it's like okay rookie quarterback who and, and I mean if they if they dump the head coach they're probably dumping everybody else too. Right. And, th- and that's the thing, like they like them going seven and ten is extremely realistic. They have a really good defense, but you're starting a rookie quarterback. And mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe that maybe that gives Eberflus a longer leash. And if that's the case, great, because I don't like Eberflus. I don't I don't like him as a coach. I I mean I I blame him like ninety five percent for the Lions coming back in that game at Ford Field. He made some really stupid decisions. So if you want to get calling was bad in that game. Yeah. If you, if, if trading away Justin Fields and drafting Caleb Williams or whatever quarterback you want first overall loosens the leash on Matt Eberflus, that's just one more reason why you should want the bears to go that route. Bingo. Anyways. Anyways, segment two. I think it's segment two time. Okay. Stop chewing on this delicious Darth Garlic beef jerky. Exclamation point jerky in the chat. Um, All right. Welcome back to the POD cast 2024 NFL combine recap edition. Now let's get to some of the players and the performances and the things we're hearing the, the characterization of some of these players. We'll start with the offense, Ryan. I want to throw it to you first and why don't you throw out either a player or a position that you want to talk about on offense. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the prospects there. Sure. Okay. I want to start at a, a position that, doesn't scream need by any means uh, just because there are a couple of players that the lions have big expectations for in 2024, but I'm going to say wide receiver. Like it's a sneaky need. Yeah. Uh, The, the future is kind of up in the air when it comes to Josh Reynolds. You want to hope that they, that there's a uh, strong enough marriage there between the two sides that, you know, Josh Reynolds is a, is a fixture here for, for as long as Jared Goff is here. Right. seems like that seems to be a perfect pairing, but it would be nice if there was some kind of contingency plan. Um, maybe if, even if it's a younger player who might even be there at 29, uh, a guy like Keon Coleman. Now, Keon Coleman drew the ire of nearly everybody on Twitter after he ran his 40. His 40 <laughs> was a 4.62. Everybody freaked out. Everybody like, oh, my God, he's he's big, but he's slow. And, you know, I, I think he measured in at about like 6'3", 212 pounds. It's like, okay, he's a bigger guy, but man, that 40 time just isn't going to cut it. But a 1.54 10-yard split, and he was the fastest wide receiver 
in the gauntlet drill, uh, the GPS tracked them at 20.36 miles per hour. So I, I feel like this is one of my least favorite things about the combine is that people read far too much into 40 times. And that's something that's going to be a consistent theme um, amongst much of our discussion here. But let me put that into context for some people because Coleman's 10 yard split of 1.54 was faster than a wide receiver who was pretty darn close to being offensive rookie of the year last year. Puka Nakua ran a 4.5740 and had a 1.62 split or one. Yeah. In, in the 10 yard split, his gauntlet time last year was something that caught a lot of people's attention when he ran the fastest gauntlet time at the 2023 combine, uh, 20.06. So Keon Coleman, I wouldn't be too worried about that 40 time. And I, and I think that that's a guy who he, maybe he does slip to 29 because yeah. people look at that 40 time and they're like, Hmm, not as fast as we thought. I love that. We're starting your conversation with this because I, th- I think it points to one important thing about the NFL combine. And, is, and that's, I think the broadcast of it is getting better because we're getting yeah. these GPS times because they are putting some of these things into context where they, they tackled exactly what you just said, right? Like let's not pay too much attention to the 40 time because this dude is balling out when he's actually on the field doing football things. And that is so important. And it, it's going to be important. With some of the other guys we talk about that we get a little obsessive over the 40 because we're all accustomed to it. We all know what is a good time. We all know what is a bad time. It's it's the first drill they they show. It's it's the one they they highlight. It's the one that, that Rich Eisen runs. All that sort of stuff. But you at like the the broadcast is so it's evolving. It's evolving to be smarter because Brad like we we always talk about. Oh, Brad Holmes pays attention to the GPS while all of these teams are only paying attention to the forty. That's not so true anymore. I think I think all the teams are starting to like realize take the forty for what it is. It's not it's not nothing. But there's so much more data in terms of, of, of taking taking notice of, of, the, of these teams' speed, these players' of speed in ways that aren't just in a straight line. So I'm with you. Like, Keanu Coleman did nothing to change his status as a very high potential first-round pick for, for any team, and, and I'm not discounting the lines in that. For sure. And we as football fans should be on the, we need to be on, be beyond the 40 yard dash thing, man. Like we gotta be, we gotta move past that. So, but when you think about like these prospects, I just try to envision them with the lions and man, think about Keon Coleman and think about the lions 11 personnel for a second here. Okay. And you'd have Keon Coleman at the X, Jamison Williams on the outside, Amon Ra on the slot. You can obviously move them around. You'd have Sam Laporta at tight end, and you'd have Jameer Gibbs or David Montgomery at running back. That is hell. That is hell for a defense to deal with. That's going to be terrible on so many different ways, right? Like, so that's that would get me really excited, and I hope this conversation starts to just think of it in that frame, right? Like, what would they bring to the table? And he would be, like, if you're a Marvel fans, he would be that last, you know, Infinity Stone where... <laughs> My goodness, man, Jeremy knows about that. Just kidding. But yeah, um, <laughs> it would be fun, right? Yeah. And I mean, the wide receiver class is, is deep. There's a lot of guys that, that I think showed up. And another interesting kind of thing that was revealed at the NFL Combine is it seems like every class is getting better and better and faster and faster. But the closer you look, it's like, oh, no, it's just the guys who are going to run fast, they choose to run. The guys that aren't going to run fast. They choose not to run. Um, And that's, I mean, that's, that leads us in a whole different direction of like, is the combine dying? Is our teams just, are players just being smarter about it and and hiding their weaknesses and, and, you know, accentuating their strengths. But I don't want to get into that, but like, obviously there's Xavier Worthy who who deserves to be talked about a little bit after setting the 40 yard dash record. Um, My guy, Xavier Leggett also absolutely showed out a, a long, like he's another I don't want to say he's like Jameson Williams because there, there, there's a difference to the game, but like he is that long distance speed guy who can break a slant into an 80 yard touchdown that again, like you, you want to put the defense in hell. You, you get a couple of big play threats uh, out there. And so if, if, if you're looking for more of a day two, if you're, if you're, if you're, I don't want to spend a first round pick on, on a receiver. Leggett is a guy who I thought showed up 
uh, in a way that that I was excited about because he was a he was the guy I talked about in our pre combine uh, prospect. Um, Roman Wilson looked great. Um, I don't know anyone else you want to talk about the wide receiver group before we move on. I mean, the the thing that's kind of a bummer is that like the top guys are the top guys, and the Lions have no shot at getting any of those players. But I think yeah. that it's at least an interesting discussion to talk about the Lions building on a strength. Right. Yeah. When, when you're talking about the Lions drafting an offensive skill position player, it's like, but Ryan, why? Why do that? It's like, I don't know. The Lions identity is score a bunch of points and then hold on for dear life. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, b- building building on that isn't necessarily a bad thing because it might come at the cost of taking cornerback six at 29. Right. Like, yeah, uh, that that's the cost of doing business sometimes. Right. So I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with entertaining the thought of the Lions building on a strength. And and it's taking last year's approach too, because the Lions were okay at skill position players last year. They they had DeAndre Swift, they had TJ Hawkinson, and they decided why not get younger, better, and cheaper. That's what the draft is all about. The Lions yeah. can stand to get better at the receiver group. They're good. They can stand to get better. They can get younger. They're pretty young. They can get younger. They can get cheaper especially when you're about to pay Amon Ross. So that's why you got to keep a lot of these things on the table because it's, it's about making strengths, a bigger strength. It's about continuing to stay young, affordable. And if the guy's there, Brad Holmes is going to take him. Oh yeah. And, and Hey, everybody was around to see Jared Goff in 2021, not saying that we're going back to the dark days, but (laughs) we we definitely want to see Jared Goff with talented skill position players around him. So, so they're not going to sign Brashad Perriman this off season is what you're saying. All right. (laughs) Morgan, where are we going next? I'm going to go a familiar route here um, in a way, but uh, Kingsley, uh, Sua, Mata, Ia. Kingsley, Sua, Mata, Ia. So I would really like, you know, that would be awesome. I don't know, obviously, with the Lions picking at 29, it's tough to decipher, like, if he's going to be there. But if he were there, that'd be great because he has some flexibility. He's super athletic. Uh, Panay Sewell's cousin, like I said, uh, could play at left guard, probably would long-term project at tackle. And wouldn't it be fun to have two really athletic, amazing, you know, just athletes at the tackle position. So that would be fun. So that's who I would look at. And then me and you, like we both have a big crush on this guy, but uh, Fuaga out of Oregon State. Yeah. Um, that would be another one you'd probably have to move up for, like maybe spend one of those day three picks to move up in the earlier twenties. But, uh, yeah, but uh, there for me. Yeah. But I mean, that, that kind of follows the thing we were talking about in segment one, the, the, the Tetris of it, where it's like both those guys might start out as a guard and then you decide what you want to do with Taylor Decker when he's done with his contract. But if you decide to move on, then you move Panay to, to left, you move one of these guys to right tackle and suddenly you're a pretty good bookend situation for your tackles for the next 10 years or whatever. Uh, And that's, I mean, for a team, we've talked about this before on the podcast, this team has always seemed to have one really good tackle for the past couple of years. They've now had two. If they can have it that way for the next 10 years, like they're going to be a top 10 team. (laughs) Like I obviously the, the key to success in the NFL is finding a good quarterback, but finding two bookend tackles is like the second, like the, I don't know the the second way to to establish long term health of of an organization, and so yeah, I'm like I I, I don't know how much I don't want to keep talking about the same guys over and over again, but Talisa Fuaga to me is like if there's a trade up possibility, he's kind of the guy I want to I want to target because man, that dude is just an absolute mauler. He's he's fast as hell, and I don't know. There's something about some of these Pac-12 guys that I'm just like. They know what's up. Maybe it's just my undying love for Panay Sewell, but that guy can ball. He's he's exactly the, the type of person that I think the Lions would love. And yeah, I don't know. I'm there, there's, The problem is there's so much talent on the offensive line that it almost feels greedy to, to waste, and, and I'm putting waste in, in quotation marks here, to waste draft capital to go up and get one when you, you could probably wait at 29 and get a very talented player there or even wait till the second or third round. Cause there's a lot of them. There's so many of them. Yeah. It, it seems rather out of character of sorts, right. In, in terms of 
we just had a discussion in the first segment where it's like, ah, I don't know if you want to spend that much for Jonah Jackson, but ah, I wouldn't mind trading up in the first round to grab a guard. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I mean, but th- there yeah. is this element of staying cheap, yeah. right? And, and, and at least, you know, getting a guy in the first round, if, if you're getting him in the early 20s or maybe even the late teens, where it, it's not nearly as expensive as extending someone like Jonah. But yeah, Jeremy, I, I totally agree. Like, I think that was one of the big takeaways from the combine in general was, holy crap, there are, is a just bevy of offensive line talent, especially uh, really all all across the board, right? Tackle, yeah. guard, like th- there's there's just talent to be had. And it seems like the exact draft that the Lions would want to be put in. Yeah, and and they're all they're all that culture fit too, because like Zach Frazier, my God, like the dude breaks a leg and he's out there running his ass off at the combine three months later, doing, doing all the drills, all the drills. Like that's all you need to know about that guy. And I know he's he's probably projecting to be a center, but you could probably slide him to guard. And hey, what do you know? You have a backup center, uh, so that you're not sliding Graham Glasgow in there in a position that he hates all the time. <laughs> Dude, and, I think he ha- he has some mitts on him too. Yeah, like his his hands were massive. Yep, Coop. I mean Cooper BB is a guy that they really like. I was reading. Um, God, who's his, what's his name? I forgot the author's name. Uh, Brand Brandon is it Brandon? The guy who's really Brandon Thorn. Uh, Thorn. 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 Thank you. I, I, yes. Subscribe to the Substack. Yeah, yes. yeah. I was reading his recap of of the offensive lineman. He pointed out Brandon Coleman, who also from no. Well, he did count up Brandon Coleman. That's the guy, UConn, the UConn guy, Christian Haynes, who also graded yes. out like crazy, uh, could be there in the second or third round. There's just, and I don't know where Zach Zinter is, but he's a guy who obviously was a, a, a huge part of all the success that Michigan had in running the ball. I know he has the injury. I don't know where whereabouts he is on that, but if the Lions, you know, if they want to take their time at the guard position and, and not necessarily start him right away, I think he can be a fit. I just... This is why, even though there's those guys at the top that are just like my dudes, I really want. Part of me is just like, nah, you got to play the board. You got to play smart here. Wait until 29 or wait until 40, whatever, 50, whatever, and and get the dude you want. Get another dude. Just, there's dudes everywhere. I do like Haynes too. I'm glad you brought him up. He's a, that's a ro- you talk about a road grader. That's yeah. a people mover right there for sure. What were you gonna say, Ryan? I was just gonna say what what's Brad Holmes thinking though. I don't know. It's hard to say because he falls in love with some some guys too, and and that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I just what, think. Yeah, true. What if I, Tuaga has, has he wants he wants him. Oh, that'd be nice, man. I keep going back to that. Putting him eventually having Fuaga and Panay playing next to each other, at left <laughs> guard and left tackle, that would be diabolical. But that would I love be. It. Um, one more guy I, I personally want to talk about, and I this is not an original thought. This is not me finding a, a diamond in the rough. This is very much me jumping on the bandwagon of, of a couple other people who pointed him out. But Tip Ryman, the tight end out of Illinois, is just a ridiculous story. A, a walk-on who, who eventually becomes captain. He's a guy that, that met with the Lions. He's a guy that just, like, absolutely fits it. Actually, I'm not sure if he met it with the Lions or not. Um, but he knows the Lions. He... I don't know, just everything about him screams Dan Campbell guy to me. And I know they just re-signed Shane Zilstra, and I know they probably bring back Brock Wright, which means the tight end room's a little bit tighter there in terms of not a huge need. They probably still want to figure out what they have in James Mitchell. But to me, that that is very much also a position where it's like, yeah, you've got these guys that are passable on your tight end depth, but why not try to improve? And I'm not saying Tip Ryman is, is a huge improvement. He's probably a day two, maybe even a day three guy. But in terms of just like, culture fit hell maybe even throw him back there and play fullback like he's that kind of dude who's like sure you want me to play fullback great i'll do that you want me to play special teams great i'll be your personal protector you want me to be the guy that that, that throws the fake punts i'll do that too i don't care just tell me what to do and i'm gonna go go do it like he's that kind of guy and so i don't know again like i kind of took more of an approach of like character evaluating some of these guys and to me tip ryman is just like you want to talk about a fit that guy's a fit this is wild though. Like we we've, we've hit on wide receiver. We've hit on interior offensive lineman. And now we're hitting on a guy who would be tight end too. Right. Like, well, when you're talking about offense, like what positions are starters, right? For sure. But I think it also speaks to kind of this um, precarious position that the lions were able to navigate all season long last year, where it's like, 
they didn't have to really deal with a whole lot of injuries True. outside of like the interior of the offensive line, right? Yep. Like they didn't have to rely on depth for long, you know, stretches of time and th- that worked to their benefit for sure, right? Like not having I I think really the only position they had depth was at running back, right? And that I mean that was a great place to have it with David Montgomery's injury that happened, you yeah. know, in the Tampa game. But outside of that, like yeah, the Lions need re like they need reinforcements you know, uh, on offense beyond just having the immediate need of guard. Right. All right. Well, let's move to defense now where there is probably more pressing needs. Um, that could very well change in the next week or two as, as free agency opens. But I don't know, Morgan, let's, let's start to you. Where, who's a, a, a position or a, a player you want to talk about on defense? So again, it's that weird exercise of like trying to be realistic of who's going to be around at 29 when the lions pick. Um, so, or even, you know, beyond that. So I really, Cam Hart stood out for me from mm-hmm. Notre Dame. So he's six foot three, he's physical. That would be a, you know, a change up from any corner the Lions have had in a while, you know, physical, former receiver. So I think, you know, some more reps, you know, at the position would help him a lot. And he had a 9.82 Raz. So that's pretty impressive. Like big physical like, and fast can run yeah so that would be yeah he's checking the boxes and if you you know trust this coaching staff that would be someone you know i don't know if he'd plug in and play right away who knows but yeah just trying to find someone who's not going to be you know obviously we love the kid from toledo that would be fun but i think he cemented his status going top 10 probably yeah so (laughs) yeah the the cornerback group was was weird to me this weekend because i think we went in thinking like this is a really deep position the lines are in a good position to, to get a good one at 20, 29, maybe in, in, on day two at some point. But the problem is, like, not a lot tested. Like, Terry and Arnold, Quinion Mitchell established themselves. Okay, you're going to have to trade up to get those guys. Let's We, we can quit dreaming. I think there was, like, a one-week period where, like, maybe Quinion Mitchell at 29 is like, oh, wait, no, he's way too good. Never mind. Um, but, like, Rake Straw has his bad, fit, bad 40, then, you know, has the groin injury, doesn't test at all. Uh, Wiggins... Also runs like a blazing 40, then suffers an injury, doesn't practice at all. Kool-Aid doesn't do anything. TJ Tampa doesn't do anything. It's like, okay, the top two guys are gone. And then like four of the guys that we're, we're going to have these conversations about drafting in, in the first or second round, all those guys don't test. And it's like, all right, then then we have to start talking about a guy like Cam Hart, who is, I think, a guy who definitely helped his, uh, his, his draft grade go up um, because of, yeah, he, he checks a lot of physical boxes, but... There wasn't, to me, there wasn't a guy this weekend where I'm just like, okay, I'm now comfortable with this guy at 29. That feels like a realistic chance. I, I don't know if there's that guy anymore. At, at cornerback, it feels, it feels less and less likely that the pick at 29 will be a cornerback. Like there's, there's something about just the strategy to the off season. We joked about it um, in our break here on, on Twitch and YouTube, but we were talking about how mock drafts can we just hold off on mock drafts for 14 days like can can we just give it a, a break until free agency takes place because it it feels i don't know just based on what happened at the combine it feels like there are the guys that are going to go at the top right and then there's a, a, a lot of question marks yeah there seem to be a lot of question marks and it seems like the lions would be smart to take the route of veteran stopgap maybe developmental prospect which it's totally fine with sure. me. Yeah, I mean you you have to you have to pair it with a sure thing though, right? Like you you have yeah. to make sure you you go in in free agency, not with like a middling mid tier guy. Like you have to go out and get a dude, and and yeah, maybe they go do that. Maybe maybe we're all looking at it wrong, and they they trade for a guy. Maybe maybe they they do go and get one of the top tier guys. Maybe they get a Lejerry Sneed. I'm I'm not discounting it completely. I I doubt it happens, but I don't know. But I. I do want to talk a little bit about Ennis Rakestraw because yeah, I think we should for sure. That one went off the rails very quickly because he went into the weekend where everyone's like, Oh cool. Like this, this physical, you know, maybe small by, by weight, but like a, a physical corner who's not afraid to play aggressively. You know, he, he's very gritty when he's out there. Like he's getting in people's faces. He's making tackles on the run game, very unafraid of contact. Tra- contact and then the minute he runs a four five one, everyone's like off the board. He's T Staber. I don't want to see him. Get him out of here. And I 
He's Saber cannot hurt you guys anymore. Yes, there, there needs to be part of that. Like we need to be beyond that part of analysis where it's, I mean, it's like the Ohio State quarterback thing, where it's like, okay, mm-hmm. like uh, you scout, have to, scout and helmets. Yeah, yeah and and I, I'll openly admit, four five one is a concerning time, right? Like if there's one position where you want to see straight line speed, corner is like the closest to where you get that on a field. That and wide receiver. So I get at least a little bit concerned. And now it comes out he has a groin injury. And if I'm not mistaken, like that's the same thing that that T Staber did, but he's like, oh, I was injured. Like, wait and see my pro day. I get all of that. I do. I really, really do. But also, let's not completely discount the guy either. Let's not completely discount the fact that maybe he is dealing with a groin injury and that shaved off or that added, you know, 0.06, right? Like, that's possible. If the guy runs a 4-4-5, do you suddenly feel a lot better? It, it's a whole different discourse, yeah. Right. No, totally. And, and, that, and we're point, literally yeah. talking about 0.06 of a second. Do you think a hamstring injury or a groin injury could could make that big of a difference? I, th- I think it probably undoubtedly. could. Undoubtedly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, undoubtedly. Like, not even a question, right? And so, right. And so, listen, there there are there are some other questions with Ray Extra, like, he is a feisty guy out there and, and he's a guy that, like I said, I, I watched a couple of his interviews with players and one really interesting thing about him. Um, he was talking about a play, I think in 2022 it's against Kentucky. He gives up a touchdown on the opening drive and he turns and he's just screaming at a teammate, screaming at him. Um, and he said like, that was something that teams have asked me about all week. What happened there? Why? And, and like, I thought his answer that he gave to, I think it was an NBC sports broadcast that was interviewing him. It was just like, listen, I, I, I got out of control. Like I can't, I can't put my safety in that position. It was my fault on the play anyways. And I need to like, I, he, he admitted like that's, that was an embarrassing part of my career because not only did I chew out a teammate like that, but I did it publicly where everyone can see it and it's replayed and all that sort of stuff. And we, we hashed it out on the sidelines and everything was cool. But like that guy is my best friend. Like I, I talked, the reason why I was like that is because I can talk to him like that. And that speaks to kind of a, a part of football culture that I think a lot of people don't understand is like, they see from the outside, these guys are screaming at each other. What the hell? Like they're going to, they're about to fight. Um, no, they, they, Aubrey, Aubrey Pleasant, Aubrey Pleasant. Right. There's, there's a different type of language with, with these people that are in close proximity for as often as they are. And what I found was actually interesting is he actually did get in a fight with a, team because i was i when he told that story i wanted to go see the exchange and i i, I type in rake straw fight he almost got in a fight with a teammate because he was helping the opposing quarterback up and the other guy on his team like shoved him and so it's like almost the exact opposite where it's like he's actually being the good sportsmanship guy trying to help up a quarterback and another guy gets in his face and shoves him around and so to me like he is feisty don't get me wrong like he wears his emotions on his sleeve. He'll he'll trash talk. He even says he loves to trash talk. But I don't know. I'm I'm not throwing away Rake Straw as a prospect because of the, the the four five one. I'm not throwing him out because of the feistiness. In fact, I like a little bit of feistiness from your corner. I think you need to have you need to have a certain amount of cockiness to play that position, right? Like, show me a good cornerback that isn't a little bit of a dick. Yeah, hundred percent. It's one of those, and you're gonna get penalties, and you're gonna get beat. So you have to like have short term memory and just keep it moving. But I wish people would take the combine for what it is, and it's usually for most people, it's just to confirm what you already have seen on tape. Yeah. Right. And I don't know. I just think people put too much into the forty time, man. We have so many examples now of it not meaning everything, and. Uh, yeah, 100% with you, too, on the feistiness. I, I would rather have that than someone who's quiet. You need to be a little nutty. Um, can let, Let's talk Let's talk Edge a little bit. Let's talk the Robinsons, the Robinson twins, as I'm going to refer to them as now, even though they are very much not related. Uh, Chop Robinson, Darius Robinson, both guys seem to be maybe around the 29 range, but two extremely different prospects. Um, I think we can all agree... Like Darius Robinson screams a Dan Campbell type of guy, again an, a guy that they did meet with a guy that I think I think like half of the Lions media was actually there, they, um not to not to generalize but um a lot of people were there. He has the Detroit ties. There's everyone saw the picture of of him and and Nick Fairley at, at Lions training camp some twenty years ago. 
it hasn't been that long. Is that that's not it hasn't no, quite been that been long. Like, it's been like ten years. It feels 10, like 11, it. 10, 11 years. Whatever. Like, Dang, twenty. <laughs> no, like like, oh, it felt like twenty. I guess. I guess Darius <laughs> Robinson wasn't one year old in that picture. Right. Right. <laughs> twenty years takes us back to like Charles Rogers' second year in the league. But I digress. Um, but I. I guess. Okay. So here's where my conundrum lays because. Chop Robinson obviously killed the combine. I think everyone knew he would in terms of speed measurements because the dude has one of the most ridiculous get offs that I've seen first steps, bend the edge, all that sort of stuff that I think you want in a pure pass rusher. There's still some technical things he needs to clean up, but in terms of like all of the physical tools that you need to potentially be an elite pass rusher in this league, I think he has it. The problem is, Mm, where's the, the butt? I was waiting for the butt. The problem is that the Lions don't seem to love those kind of guys. A one-trick pony? Yeah. And and, and not no, to say... I, he, I, 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 right. right. I don't want to paint him like that because I wanted to ask you the question, Jeremy, because I think I saw you tweet about, you know, you went back and you looked at some chat film to be like, okay, like he gets a lot of grief for his run defense. What does that actually look like? And, and it, it needs work, for sure. Um, But but I do question, like, I, I, think, I think there's a level of frustration bubbling on the surface with Lions fans with what the Lions have done with their defensive line because they have Aiden Hutchinson who can pass rush who can set the edge and then on the opposite side they seem to prefer the guy that sets the edge a guy that can come like your John Kaminsky's your, your Josh Pascal's they prefer those kind of guys which is Darius Robinson that's who he is now you could be throwing the same kind of guys at the position and you're like is that is that good do we need another Josh Paschal? Do we need another um, one of those guys, John Kaminsky's? I almost forgot him. You don't forget, don't overlook John Kaminsky. We're back to that again. Um, and then when you talk about like these pure pass rush guys, what kind of resources have they spent on those guys? Late sixth day, round pick James Houston. Sixth round pick James Houston. CFL min, veteran minimum contract with no guarantees. Matthew Betts. Are they willing to spend a first round pick on a guy like Chop Robinson, who, to be clear, way better than James Houston, way better than Matthew Betts? Sorry, CFL fans. But also is going to be a little bit of a liability, maybe a lot bit of a liability early on as a as an run defender. I, I I mean, there's a veteran name too that you're forgetting. Charles Harris. I mean, that that was another very low risk, like this guy's more pass rusher than than yeah. run defender than edge setter. Yeah. But th- that speaks to it. This isn't like, oh, this is what the Lions did last offseason. No, it's like this is what the Lions have done since Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell have walked through the door. Is yeah. like they have their type. So it's like, are you getting yourself distracted with, oh, the super bendy guy who put up numbers that were even better than Micah Parsons at the combine? Like, are you getting enamored with that for absolutely no reason? Like, we had a little bit of this conversation last draft with, um, was it Nolan Smith, right, from mm-hmm. from Georgia? Right, the, the yeah. The same linebacker who ended up going to Philly, and it was like... Of course, he went oh, to Georgia, like, he went to Philly. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, if, if, if you're the Lions, right, like, if they take a guy like that in the first round or they take a guy like that in the early second round, then that really signals something to you, but they didn't. And I, I don't want to get into that trap, though, because that's how you end up with Jack Campbell at 18, right? It's like, oh, the Lions don't value running <laughs> linebackers. They, they they don't, you know, look at their investments in linebackers. It's very minimal. It's it's late round picks. It's, you know, Alex Anzalone, cheap contracts, you know, to get him in the door. And then it's pick 18, Jack Campbell. Like, okay, they could, they could zag because this might sure. be their guy. Maybe. Like, they might be like, okay, Chap Robinson's the dude. We've been waiting for this guy. I, but there's a lot of evidence that suggests otherwise. Right. And and like if 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 those two guys were the only options they had, like I'm betting nine times out of ten they're going Darius Robinson. I guess my bigger question is like, do you have a problem with that strategy? Do you have a problem with the Lions tendency to want those edge setters on the other side of Aiden Hutchinson that that can also like slide in and play some defensive tackle on third downs? Or do you think this team needs to change their philosophy a little bit and just get a hellraiser in the passing in the pass rush game, a guy with, I think, a, a very high ceiling like like Chop Robinson. I think you go either way. Like I would love to have a guy like Chop just because it's a you know he would be another one like Hutchinson where you could rely on him to win quickly on the edge on third down, like where you only maybe you could only rush for and generate pressure. 
that would help the secondary along a lot, just even if they do upgrade. I hope they upgrade the talent. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can't really, I don't want to get mad at, about their <laughs> approach because it's a, it's a big reason why they're so good against the run too, right? True. Like they've they, they prioritized to do this. And yeah. so, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not... Yeah, go ahead. It, it, no, I was just going to say, like, it, it almost feels like a create a defense. Like, okay, we have the number one run, run defense. Can we take that down to, like, a tenth and, like, raise up the, the pass rush a little bit? Can we can we take a little bit from this category and make it better? I know it doesn't work like that, but, like, philosophically, that's kind of how I feel. It's like, let's let's pull a little bit back on, on prioritizing run defense so much and try to plug in a little bit more resources into just getting to the quarterback. Mm-hmm. Well, because then it makes you wonder about, you know, the whole chicken and the egg argument, right? It's like, well, I don't know. Is Cam Sutton, did he have as rough as a, you know, end of the season as we were expecting? Or is it because the Lions had to, you know, send extra defenders to to generate any sort of pressure? Yeah. I mean, um, but the one other guy that I want to throw out there for defensive end, and it's a guy I talked about leading up to the combine, who absolutely killed the combine too, and fits more in that Darius Robinson mold is is marshawn nealon from western yep. michigan yep do your victory lap Look, I, i'll do my little victory lap but like i just i i want to throw this out there because i think that this is incredible but like he ran a faster three cone 7.02 and a faster shuttle time 4.18 than all of the defensive linemen and linebackers <laughs> at indy <laughs> now i know jeremy's not high on the linebackers but like I mean, he also had a vertical jump of 35 and a half inches and a 1.66 10-yard split. Remember when I talked about Keon Coleman? He ran a 1.64 10-yard <laughs> split. Jeez. Like, Neil Neyland is a freak. And How much does he weigh? Um, I think he... 268. 6'3", 268. And, I mean, his his RAS was 9.54. And his arm length... 34 and a half inches. Like you want to talk about another guy that they could put on the opposite side of Aiden Hutchinson and not even have to worry about how Josh Pascal plays or how John, if John Kaminsky's on the football team, yeah, like that, that would just be Marshawn Nealon. I think the interesting discourse with him though, is like, because of what he did at Indy, is he officially like a first round pick? He still seems like a fringe guy because there's like question yeah. marks about like, again, you know, a little bit lack of production. He did play at a Mac school. You know, right. you have your question marks, but it's also like, man, would I love to get that guy in the door to be coached by Terrell Williams? Yes. Yeah. Um, defense. Uh, we should talk a little about defensive tackle before we get out of here. Obviously, some interesting, and, and we've talked about this on just about every podcast and almost every week. It seems like it's it's hard to know what the lines want here because we don't know where the, the ideal position for to them is for a guy like Ali McNeil but we what we do know is and and we also don't know where Broderick Martin is right so do they want a defensive tackle like could Tavondre Sweat be in the conversation there in the first or second round or is the plan to to have Broderick Martin be your nose tackle do they want a three tech that could potentially move um Ali McNeil inside to me, they just like they need bodies. The problem is, I just don't know where they stand on the guys that they currently have, and that makes it kind of hard to project which guys. But I don't know, is is there a particular prospect or something that you just like? You like they're 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 Dan Campbell dudes. They're they're guys that the the team would find a way to play. I think I liked uh, what Fisk, Braden Fisk, did mm -hmm. from Florida State. Yeah, I liked what he did at the combine. He tested really well would probably be a day two pick now. I think his stock would bring him up to, you know, definitely day two, I would assume. Um, and that would be a nice little, you know, another rotational piece at the three tech opposite Aleem. Uh, you could throw him in in a bunch of different packages and I think he'd produce. So I really liked him and what he showed. And yeah, that's another, it's, yeah. I love the point we talked about it before we hopped on, but it's, it's really just how they evaluate. Like, do they think Broderick's going to, when do they think Broderick's going to be ready? Um, and yeah, there's so many variables at play there. Well, and, and we talked about that too, Jeremy, <clears throat> um, in the Q and a show about like, what is Aline McNeil's worth to this football team? When you're talking about like <clears throat> roster construction and, uh, you know, the, the Tetris that is required as soon as you have to start paying some of these guys, like 
are you going to pay Aleem McNeil like he's one of your, you know, five most important players on your football team or, you know, top seven most important football, you know, players on your team? Like that becomes an interesting part of the calculus when it comes to this roster construction. And it's like, okay, you bring in a guy like Broderick Martin, clearly developmental, but that guy's a nose tackle. Yeah. It's like, so do you want only McNeil to, to play at the three tech or are you, as as you said, are you so concerned with like, let's just get dudes in the building and we'll figure out where Aleem plays. It's like, it almost seems like that's an easier strategy, right? Because yeah. it opens up, it, you cast a wider net. Like you don't have to, you know, pigeonhole yourself into taking a specific prospect because they played this specific position. But I just love Aleem's ability, like when he's playing the, the, the three tech. Yeah. Like I, I love his size there. I love what the lions were able to do around him. You know, if he can stay healthy and if he can have a guy that just like eats up space in the middle, like what will that, I mean, I don't know that that's just a having a Lee McNeil and Aiden Hutchinson right next to each other on one side of the line feels like a recipe to success. As long as you get the one other guy on the other side, just to say you want a 366 pound, Devondre sweat out there i whatever like let's do it like i don't care like i don't know is it is it more but it, again it's the same discussion we just had about edge like how yeah. important is that guy that they draft in the middle to stopping the run yeah and if that is the thing then it's like okay then you need to take a nose tackle because you want to use a ability like as a pass rusher like that's what you want to tap into you don't i don't think you want to just be like okay a you're you're stopping up the run like that's what you do but it's like but maybe they have know. the dudes already. Like if they re-sign Benito Jones and Broderick Martin becomes a rotational guy, are you, I mean, that's okay. Right at nose. Yeah. It's just a huge, I mean, maybe the biggest question mark on their roster outside of Hendon Hooker is like, I don't know who Broderick Martin is Yeah, at yeah. all. Yeah. That's fair. Competition wasn't high, you know, and yeah, that's, that's true. I, I wonder, cause that's, that's the thing, right? It's his projection because if you take a Devondre Sweat, like, you know, I know they, they liked Broderick's pass rushing chops despite how huge he is. Uh, but I don't know. That might be a little bit of a log jam, right? Yeah. No, bring back a 37-year-old a Tyson Alualu or whatever he is. <laughs> just, just go get Chris Jones. It's it's just, I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> just kickers. But, like, they were so good at the run defense, and I know, like, you, you can say Benito's not very good. You can say Isaiah Bugs wasn't very good. You can say Tyson Alualu wasn't very good. But also, they stopped the run. Like, that's that's those guys' primary job. I know I know it's not pretty. I know the PFF scores look bad. But I, I, I don't trust PFF when it comes to two-gapping defensive tackles. Because it doesn't look good on tape, right? These guys are just holding ground. That's essentially what their entire job is. They're not penetrating. They're not getting TFLs. They're just standing their ground, and that's what those guys have done, and it's allowed the linebackers to play very well. I mean, we give all these credit to the second-tier defenders. We, we say this linebacking crew is way better than, than we expected. That's because of the dirty work some of these guys are doing, and you don't have to invest that highly in these guys, right? You don't have to spend a ton of money on Benito Jones. You can get Broderick Martin late in the third round. So, like, while Tavondre Sweat, and listen, Tavondre Sweat, way better than these guys, can also pro- provide a little bit in the pass rush. Part of me is like, no, don't do bother. Like, let's just keep going the rotational, like, guys that we can get off the street at nose tackle that, that are good, that are gritty, that are that are big. Like, you, you can you can find those guys. I don't want to say dime a dozen necessarily, but don't spend a ton on them so that you can get these dynamic three techs that, that can disrupt and, and, and penetrate and hell raise. That's what I want. Sure. They're, they're your defensive counterpart to how you feel about running backs on offense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know why people hate Benito Jones. Benito Jones is a, is a solid pro. He wears funny, cool outfits. <laughs> well, you know, what's there to not like, guys? Come, yeah, I like yeah. Coming, yeah. Jones. Coming soon as to stream. Far as, yeah, as, as far as interior defenders go, let's just keep operating on vibes. Let's, <laughs> just, keep, let's just keep operating on vibes. <laughs> Um, any other players you guys want to talk about before we get out of here? Anyone that we missed that, that you was, was your dude this weekend? Either side of the ball. I liked what, uh, Braswell did from Alabama. Um, edge defender could, you know, stand up. He ran like a four, six. I think he's six, three, two fifty something. 
So he'd have some, you know, he he could be another like what what they wanted Julian and Charles Harris and everyone else potentially to be in this sure. defense. And I don't think he would cost anything crazy. I think he'd be like a day two, uh, you know, second or third round pick if I had to guess right now. So, yeah. Those edge, those edges are tough to find out. Like, I think I think everyone's crossing their fingers and just thinking like, ah, oh, James Houston, Matthew Betts, they got this. But and it, add yeah. competition. They need to add yeah, it without Julian, w- without Charles. Like, there needs to be more competition in that room, even if you think those two guys are the ones that are going to eventually win out. And Braswell's used to it. I think he he's been splitting snaps at Alabama because they've always had you know, monsters over there. So yeah, he'd be a fun one to add. And I don't think he'd break the bank in terms of draft capital. What about you, Ryan? Um, you know, I, maybe just some more interior defensive linemen. Cause I think that was just an interesting spot, but like um, Chris Jenkins from Michigan had a really good combine. Um, I know that um, over on the athletic uh, Deontay Lee talked about how um, both, uh, both Murphy and Jenkins like seem like guys who can, like carry more weight than what they brought to Indianapolis. Right. Because we, we talked about that as an aspect of the combine where it's like, you're showing up to an athletic event that isn't a football event. And may, maybe you want to be a guy who slims down a little bit so you can put up some pretty good agility numbers. But like, again, like have, having like guys that could carry like three fifteen and still be athletic as they are like, yeah, like beef up the middle and maybe run on vibes plus talent. Vibes plus talent is a is a great. Um, I like that mix. Vibes yeah, and is, talent. yeah. Vibes and talent is a great formula for the middle of the defensive line. Is that Chris Jenkins' son? It is. Yeah, the former just badass oh. for the Carolina Panthers. Yeah, I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jeremy? I was only. I'm trying to find his measurements really quick because I'm not being a good host and finding it. But anytime I hear. Someone who, uh, in a media session with Colton Pouncey, a side to side, say, saying I met with the Lions and quote and and cover your 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 kids' ears for a second. They fuck with me and I fuck with them. <laughs> Illinois defensive tackle Johnny Newton. I I I can't say I know a ton about him, but like as soon as I saw that tweet from Colton today, I'm like. Your guy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start to look at closer, and that's again, like that's what it, what Indianapolis is all about. It's about finding out those dudes that that the Lions are interested in that fit what they want, and so just a name to throw out there to, to people listening. Johnny Newton, Illinois defensive tackle, he's a guy that that is suddenly on my radar because of of that tweet from Colton Pouncey from the Athletic. Six one three hundred. Six one and a half. I I'm into pull it. it up off the, yeah. Last question, Jeremy. How much would oh, that's you pay Zer- that's, to be is able? Is that Jazurahan? Jazan. Is that the same guy? He goes by yes. Johnny. Let's see, yes. this this is why I need to pay closer attention to the draft. He might need, he's way up at like he probably's not even available. I had I had the the Excel doc open and I deduced who you were talking about. Through yeah, that, yeah, like me- medicals though, right? Like foot injury, some concerns about that. Yep. Yeah, but again, that's that's what the combine is interested in in figuring out is you know yeah. medical evals and. But I was I was going to ask Jeremy, how much would you pay to be able to see the interviews that they're doing? <sighs> Man, because that's the, that's like that's like our favorite part of watching. Yeah, like inside, inside the den. Inside the den. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I would pay ten times what I'm paying for crappy ESPN Plus. I can tell you that much. <laughs> that's all I need. To, <laughs> that's all I wanted. That was an alley for you to slam on ESPN Plus. So. <laughs> Way to throw it down. <laughs> All right. You and Eric, Eric hate that so much lately. Apparently so do at least 3,000 other people who like my tweet slamming ESPN+. <laughs> um, but we're going to get out of here. Uh, like I mentioned, we're since we're only a week away from free agency, we're going to have a, a free agency special midweek POD cast coming later, probably recorded on Thursday. Um, I'm pretty sure we're going to have a midweek mailbag, but it's probably not going to be at its normal time. And maybe even a first bite smushed into there all together a lot of content coming your way because a lot is happening this is like the the heat of the off season here in the next couple weeks here so make sure you're following us on all of our podcasting platforms if you want to watch us live where we answer questions in between segments head to our youtube or twitch page but for morgan for ryan feel better chris it's chaos be kind recording stopped
<clears throat> All right. We're out. Guys. Guys, any any questions? I don't know. I I I was hoping I was going to come up with something to say in that moment and I didn't come up with anything. So, I'm going to read alerts. I feel like we went really long that segment. I was not paying attention. I think we did, but <laughs> whatever. Did we? It's fine. Um all right. Sw- Swag Kazakage, 11 months subscribed to the channel, says Darius Robinson, round one, Saint Shrill, round two, signed Jonah and Graham. Mm. Hmm. Mm. What do you guys feel about Saint Shrill? Do you think he can play outside, or do you think it's more like he moves Brian Branch to safety? Or he plays safety? Mm. I don't know. That's an interesting question. I think I just come back to the point that I want Brian Branch as close to the line of scrimmage as possible. That's fair. Me too. Me too. I don't know if you can move Brian Branch, man. Brian Branch is about to be all pro at nickel for like the foreseeable future. Him and McDuffie. So I don't know. Yeah. But I do like Sandstrill. It's like that question, do they like him so much they take him and they're like, I will figure it out. Yeah, right. And it's certainly possible. It doesn't seem like it makes sense, but did it make sense to draft Brian Branch after you, you – Got C.J. Gardner Johnson. Not and, and it's it's different, right? Gardner Johnson's on a one year deal. He's a veteran. You just drafted Brian Branch, who's going to be on your team for the next eight years. Yeah, but but by that same token, though, I mean there was still Kirby Joseph. There was still, I mean, the, the Lions hadn't released Tracy Walker at that point, right? right? Like I think they very much still viewed Tracy Walker as a contributor for the defense, but um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's a matter of like just drafting a guy and figuring out where they fit. For some reason, I feel like that doesn't feel true for the secondary room. You know what I mean? Like, I feel almost comfortable saying that about like the defensive line where it's like, okay, you know what? Maybe if they, however they view Aleem, I'm cool with it, right? Just like draft a guy that you can get next to him that you feel really confident in. Or if you're going to draft a guy opposite of Aiden Hutchinson, it's like, and you want them to be another edge setter. Okay, fine. Like, yeah, but it seems like with the secondary, it's like the Lions need at least one outside corner, probably two. When you're talking about free agency and you're talking about the draft, you're saying like they need at least two. Yeah, out outside cornerbacks. It's like uh, maybe you can get a guy in the in the room to like special teams and nickel, right? But it's like then you're taking you're taking food off Will Harris's table. Right, Morgan. So, <laughs> you want to bring Will Harris back? Is that is that what you're saying? Oh, everyone loved that article, and, and you know, <laughs> I just, come on, man. I here's here's the thing that I think Will Harris drafted as a safety. But the thing yep. that annoys me about the reaction to that article is like, there's a, I would say I would say like a fifty fifty chance that they resign Will Harris, and it's yep. not necessarily a bad move. Everyone expects every single re-signing or every single, every single signing has to be a guy who's capable of starting. A clear upgrade, right? They have right. to be a yeah. clear upgrade, right? The Lions <laughs> have moved past players like Will Harris. It's like... They may no. have. They may have. They may have, to be yeah. clear. like At the bottom of the roster? I don't know. Like special teams yeah. guys okay, but, play but a utility role? Will Harris, in 2022, was a guy who filled in for outside corner. Yep. Yeah, you don't want that happening. Right. They sure. they stopped that in 2023. They they needed an outside corner desperately. They were pulling guys off the street not willing to play Will Harris. Kendall Vildor, yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Fair so really. and so That's like there is a little bit of we've probably moved on from him at least a little bit. But I also think he's a guy that can play special teams. He's a guy that can play multiple positions. I There's, said it in the article too. I was like while he's not starter level or something, for <laughs> right? Reason, like I'm like, guys, it's just, it just can be worse. He can just back up multiple positions. That's going to be the only, and he'll still he'll be an NFL player for a couple years, I bet you, because some other team will be like, oh shoot, he can back up, you know? Yeah. I, don't know. I just think, I I just think it a guy that 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 can at least like at least has the knowledge to play multiple positions is someone that's valuable to have on your yes. fifty three. He doesn't yes. have to be number 23. He, he can be number 53 and have that role. Literally number 53 on the roster. 
and, and the tough thing about that too, right, is like replacing that player. It's like Will Harris has been in that building for how many years now, right? And he's been yeah, under yeah. multiple multiple coaching regimes. It's like if you're going to replace that player who you at least trust in the sense that they are a veteran, yeah, that's not going to be a draft pick most likely, right? Right, Because you're, you're taking a younger guy who doesn't have the experience, has to, you know, learn the league and and, and get, get their bearings. So it's like, you're not, that's not like a one-to-one trade-off. Like, you're not trading like youth in an upgrade for a guy that you trust as much. Right. Mm-mm. And it's like, okay, like, are they going to go out in free agency and replace Will Harris? Well, like, with what? Another Will Harris. <laughs> right. so, a Will so, Harris so, that doesn't know the defense. A yep. Will Harris to, like, you know, the Baltimore Ravens fan base, right? Like, I, right. I feel like every every team has their Will Harris. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And it's like, you could go get the Baltimore Ravens Will Harris, and it's like, you know, Ravens fans would be like, oh, gosh, thank God we're getting rid of him. And Lions fans would be like, I don't know. Like, there might be some upside. <laughs> it's like, change of scenery. Right, yeah. And then there's somebody else who's like, well, look at all the games that Will Harris – I mean, he started outside corner in 2022. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's versatile, you know? Like, could be something. You know, our team if, could have something with Will Harris. If he like, signs somewhere else, we will go and read. There will be, like, an article on the Jacksonville Jaguars website <laughs> saying he's Big got a country. lot of versatility. Yeah. yeah. Bunch he, of versatility. He got, he got pushed out by Brian Branch, like a, a, a Pro <laughs> Bowl <laughs> level. Okay. Matt Patricia took him in the third round, like a you know, just <laughs> awesome. Him and Bob Quinn, yeah, dude, it'll it'll happen. Just watch, guys. It'll watch. Just watch. I listen, and, and people think too. Like I wish they'd read the whole article, but it wasn't me advocating for to resign Will Harris, guys. We got to do the whole series, man. Right. That, that's the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is we try. We don't necessarily succeed, but we try to do one on <laughs> literally every single Everybody. free agent. Um, because listen, every, yep. there's there's a reasoning for that beyond just like filling up time. These, a lot of these guys, if they're not going to land in Detroit are going to land somewhere. And I like when, you know, another team signs someone and they're like, Will Harris profile. Our, our website pops up and they have like a good background of who this person is, what, what they did last year, what they did this year, why they may or may not be resigning. Like, it's good to have our site be that resource for someone else, even if the people here don't necessarily appreciate it. <laughs> I get it. I mean, he's had some rough performances, but it's almost like it's when people are like, oh my God, our, the Lions offensive line depth sucks. So does everyone else's, man. There's right. just not enough good ones. All right. That's why we need a viable <laughs> USFL or ZL or whatever the hell league is going to come next. We need one of those to stick so <laughs> offensive linemen can get better because – it's just not enough, man. It's the bottom line. My my thinking with these articles too is like, when I know when the Lions sign someone, that's the uh, kind of article I want. Like, if yeah. I want to read it, like I want to be able to read that and and have it be an honest assessment from fans of what he did good, what he didn't do good. And so, For sure, yeah. I'm just saying, if more <clears throat> people were like pride of Detroit, the world would be a better place. That's all I'm saying. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of speaking of good articles, though, like uh, I'm assuming, Jeremy, did you read the uh, the Jason Fitzgerald over the cap article on Marshawn Lattimore? I did. I I tried. It was dense. It was. It was very dense. I enjoyed it was the I, I enjoyed the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's definitely something that I shouldn't have tried reading at um, like six thirty this morning while I was like brushing my teeth. Yeah. And getting ready because I was like, this is a lot. But I did get to the paragraph that I thought it was at least most interesting in the in the immediacy of the Lions. And it's like what the what the cost would be to get Marshawn Lattimore, at, at least like the historical precedence of like recent trades. Right. He said what, like a fifth? Yeah. Um, just because he, he mentioned like what might trade compensation look like. And he's like, probably not too much. Uh, he said... Jalen Ramsey, who is just one year older, was traded for a third round pick and a third round tight end who never saw the field in two years. Yeah. So, like, I don't, do, is Lattimore the name that Jalen Ramsey is? No. Um, and and also, like, injuries. yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, for a fifth round pick, 
it seems like the risk seems so minimal for the Lions. The, the risk is all in cap. I was going to say, what's that number looking like? All in cap, which is the picture part that Jeremy was really enjoying. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll show on screen. Well, yeah. While while you pull it up, Jeremy, I was going to say the thing that you love immediate right is this guy knows Aaron Glenn. Yep. This guy knows Dan Campbell. Yep. Um. That's true. And hey, anybody who's willing to get into a fist fight with Mike Evans is a friend of mine. So. <laughs> um. Dang, what do you got against Mike Evans? Dude, he was killing I, us that playoff game. My God. Okay. I like, th- chill out, man. Chill I th- out. I think. Um. I think the problem I have with Mike Evans is Mike Evans fans. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I like that. And this is not a shot at Jerry. Cause I know Jerry on staff loves Mike Evans. Cause he's just like the model of consistency. Yeah. But like Mike Evans has, um, I'm trying to think of like a good, like quarterback analogy. Almost, almost kind of like Mike Evans is like the Matthew Stafford of wide receivers. Oh boy. Like how ma- how many all pro selections does Mike Evans has? Does Mike Evans mm. have? I'm not I'm not sure, but like it's it, if he has one, it's not more than one. Now I'm gonna look this up. Yeah. Was he th- was he this year or am I tripping? He, no, I don't. Oh, he might not have any. He's a five time okay. Pro Bowler. Okay. Oh wait, so no, this is what. I- he was second team this year and second team in 2016. Second team okay. doesn't count. Uh, second team doesn't count. Okay. If you're not first, if you're not first team All Pro, you're the you're the first at, or last. <laughs> at, at any point in your career, like don't talk about this guy like he's like th- that's fair. The the best wide receiver in the league at any point. Like and and that that's like a little bit not fair to like because Matthew Stafford maybe was never in that conversation, but like he's like Philip um, Rivers. I mean, like even Matt Ryan, like Matt Ryan won an MVP. And like wasn't all pro, but like if you're never like consistently the best player at your position, like people talk about Mike Evans like he's a first ballot unanimous Hall of Famer. It's like, like I don't he reminds me of Julio, honestly. But Julio's peaks were higher and he was yeah. very clearly like the <clears> best <throat> wide receiver in the NFL at like certain points in his career. Like Julio I, I can like a Calvin arc to me. I can say with conviction that Mike Evans never had an arc like Julio Jones or Calvin Johnson or pick pick other big name wide receivers from this generation. Because they like, were both the best, like undisputable best at one point. The Julio pro- you was, know what the Calvin problem was? was? Chris Godwin's the problem. If they never draft him, it's all about Mike Evans. Man, I don't love Chris Godwin. <laughs> Have you had caffeine tonight or something? What are you what are you doing? <laughs> Me? You're doing some crazy stuff, yeah. Yeah, you know this is no the, you just you don't like this is my dynamic with ryan i just like to needle him <laughs> was mike was mike evans was he ever deandre hopkins no no, but no. DeAndre, deandre hopkins what was he ever antonio brown <sighs> no hopefully not <laughs> hopefully not yeah no, you, you wouldn't want to be right now but like <laughs> Free, that's, yeah. that's what i mean though like I don't know. Like, I just don't view him in that tier of like, even, even I would put like AJ green above him. Oh yeah. Okay. AJ green was first team all pro a couple of times, I think. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I, I don't think Mike Evans was ever in consideration for being the best player at his position okay. ever, but okay. people talk about him. Like he's a, listen to me, damn it. I'm just saying like a lot of third play, like <laughs> third best wide receiver in the NFL is why, why are you trashing on that guy? Those no, Bucks but... fans are just kind of crazy with their plastic pirate ship and shit, man. <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, stick to your your some, yeah your creamsicles. But those are nice. I will say, <laughs> those are nice. I love them. I do like that they served creamsicles at that game. To the also, to I the press. Say, I do love. Oh my god, dude! I love creamsicles. <laughs> those are so lot. good. Yeah. Can't um, have a box of them in the house where I eat them all. <laughs> Let me let me go back to Marshawn Lattimore because that's what this conversation was initially about. Um, now we're talking about ice cream. Okay. So I don't quite understand the mechanics of this contract, if I'm being completely honest. But if the if the Lions acquire Marshawn Lattimore and choose not to exercise his option, which I think is a smarter option, at least for where the Lions are at, he does 
take on a 15 million cap hit this year, but no dead money in the next two years. So he has, which is like fantastic. Yeah. So you have an out after this year. Yeah. A, a clean 100% out. So if it doesn't work out, you could say, wow, 18 million for Marshawn Lattimore next year. No, thanks. See you later, bud. And it costs you a sixth round pick and one year of a one year tryout granted at a pretty hefty price, but probably worth it. If you want to go, the, work, yeah. yeah. If you want to go the more financially responsible this year, you can exercise the option. He's only going to cost four million against the cap this year, but that jumps to twenty million next year, and eleven million of that is dead money. So if you caught him, you you would save nine million in dead cap or nine million in cap space, but you'd still be paying eleven million. So basically, it's in the way it, it's kind of the same. Like it, it's kind of the same if you cut him after one year, because it'll cost him four million this year, eleven million next year, whereas you take all fifteen million in the first year here. That's how it works. Does that make yeah. sense? So I guess it's just a matter of how you want to move your shells, right? Like, <laughs> and I think maybe like in the here and now, with like the salary cap being higher than they had projected, like yeah. what, like ten ten million dollars more than they had projected, right? Um. Maybe. Yeah, it becomes an interesting balancing act. But yeah. I'm all about like a fifth round pick for Marshawn Lattimore. But 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 the time ti- the, t- the timing is the problem. Like we were was yep. that was on stream, right? That we were talking about the, yeah. the timing. Yeah. Where it's just like you have to like have the deal in waiting all off season. <laughs> and you wouldn't be able to bring him onto your roster until July. Like right before training camp. And he He's only played, he played seven games in 2022 and then 10 games in 2023. And he's 20, he's 27. So like I would be, if they did this, this would be fine because if his play falls off a cliff late into his twenties, then you have an out, whatever. But I'm with Ryan though. If you shoot, if he plays 14 games at a Marshawn Lattimore level, you know, he's a first team corner. Like, you know, he's a, 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 you know, a one a corner, no doubt about it when he's healthy. Yeah, that, that I, that's what I mean. Like the upside to that, as RGA says, maybe uh, Eagles twenty twenty five fourth round pick from the Swift deal. I don't know. There you go. Yeah, I think it's probably well. I guess this is in the future. You could. It still seems a little bit high for me. What I would pay, but it it work. Um, let me get through some alerts here, catch up, and then uh, we'll answer one or two more questions and get out of here. Uh, Nick the Greek 100 bits I don't think I'm going to read that because I see the word sack I see the word balls I'll just let chat let their imagination run wild there thank you for the 100 bits LJB Rough 51 months subscribe to the channel says so much content love it appreciate it LJ I've actually I've gotten a lot of people saying like hey like they've apologized to me (laughs) I've gotten an email and I think two tweets and maybe a DM of just like Hey, I just want to apologize. I haven't listened to any podcast since the playoffs. I'm tired or I'm, I, I'm like the the most interesting one was one I received today. I can't remember. I think it was a, a tweet, a tweet. It was like, I'm so less interested in the off season now because well, I, I think it was twofold one, because the season was so fun Two because I'm just like, I'm like completely giving myself up to the process. I trust Brad Holmes so much. I'm not going to sit back in armchair GM anymore because that guy's got it. (laughs) And I feel that like, I, I feel that Brad, take the wheel. Yeah. Someone write a song. Who Mm -hmm. wrote that song that, you know, Jesus take the wheel, but Brad take the wheel. That's our music. Our song. But then by proxy, I feel like that also means like, I don't care what you guys have to think. I care what Brad Holmes has to think. And also point taken. (laughs) Like what I, I mean, listen, the Lions certainly would have drafted Jameer Gibbs last year if if they had listened to me. So, whoever is saying Rod take the wheel, no, <laughs> no, no. RGA four eighteen. I'm throwing a flag on that. <laughs> That's no good. Unnecessary um, roughness. <laughs> yeah, no way. Uh, Nick the Greek, another hundred bits. What the hell? I'm gonna read this one. Uh, sorry, Chris, if you're listening or watching. Uh. Chris Furfett has an origin story very similar to Chop Robinson. When Chris was born, he came out with a large tuft of chest hair, shocking the nurses because that's very rare for a half-Irish baby. 
The nickname became even more legendary after Chris's penchant for furry conventions and became public knowledge. I'm sorry, Chris. I should have heard that. I really, man. Where does he? I don't know. <laughs> Nick the Greek. I don't know. I don't know what level you live on. <laughs> Uh, not that obvious. Thank you for the nine months subscribed to the channel. <laughs> Nick the Greek, another one bit says, which one of you is spreading the trade JMO for Sneed rumor on Twitter? No, I, I'm sorry, chat. I have to do this again. I hate doing this, but I need to admonish lions. Twitter. One guy, <laughs> one guy, one chiefs guy throws out a tweet. Five days until this guy's is ours, and it's and it's about the Chiefs trading for JMO for Sneed, and everyone decides ne- to never give in it, a million years, dude. It's it's not going to happen yet. Every single person on Lions Twitter suddenly feels it's their personal responsibility to dunk on this guy, and you know what happens? This guy's one opinion gets magnified, and suddenly we're talking about it like it matters. Stop it. Stop it. The guy isn't a writer. The guy isn't an insider. He's a guy on Twitter. And that's it. That's it. That's his. And, and now we got people writing about it. What are we doing? Stop yeah. it. You don't have to be the 500th guy to n- say the same thing. <laughs> Stop it. I'm like, I'm done dunking on bad tweets and bad takes because you don't need me to do it. There's there's 5,000 other people there on Twitter to do it. Right. I've I've been less active on Twitter and I've I've noticed I feel better. It's always good for the health. <laughs> it is. I just mute people. I'm, I've, I'm on my Kato, I'm on my Kato game. Mm-hmm. You got you got like one slip up. Yeah. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. I want to pull up this guy's Twitter account and see just, okay. He has 2,679 followers. That's it. Guy was less than 3,000 followers sent Lions Twitter in a frenzy today. Gosh, when I had that many followers, I was talking about how much I like Brad Kaya. (laughs) Dude, I, I, I was at the card store the other day and I almost bought an autographed Brad Kaya card. Just for, I think it was three dollars. <laughs> I was like, "This is like this would be an awesome addition <laughs> to the to the PC," as the kids say, the personal <laughs> collection. <laughs> oh man! Yeah, anyways, um, another hundred bits from Nick the Greek says TG Hawken fans are officially worse than Mike Evans fans. That's that's TJ only- Hawkinson fans. Does TJ Hawkinson have a big fan base? Well, I mean, I, I think I think he's just getting at Vikings fans at this point. And we all know Vo- Vikings fans are very much going through it right now. Okay, but the tough thing is it's like I like some Vikings fans. I did. I just I just haven't <laughs> liked the side that I've seen from them in the past, <laughs> you know, few months. <laughs> when when it I no, two part question. Do you think Daily Norseman knows that we've blocked them by now? And when do I unblock them? <laughs> Yes and no to answer both those questions. No, I don't unblock them. And the, yes, they was, know. The answer to was, when should I unblock them is no. No. Yeah, I was going to say don't care and no. <laughs> don't care and no. That's all. Dude, that was, they were on a run, man. I was like, for a little bit, I was like, wh- who is this? What kind of off, you know, you know, this is some, some uh, Bush League stuff. And then I was like, oh no. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm not. Nah. Like their tweets were so bad that I was at least hoping that they would be like, "Oh, sorry, our account got hacked." <laughs> yeah, or like we had at least at, at least do that lie. Yeah, you know what Something. I mean. Someone got drunk and was just going through it, tweeting through it. I yeah, or like I don't know who am I to talk about accountability though? You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean here's the thing. I understand, and and I do it a little bit with the Pride of Detroit account, where you just kind of, you lean into the fandom a little bit, right? You you play mm-hmm. to the fans a little bit. You 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 yell at the refs a little bit more than maybe you actually would inside. You you 
you tease your your rivals a little bit more. That's and and if that's what I felt like this was, then I'd be fine with it. But like, they they went overboard, big time. Like calling everything dirty and like retweeting all like, oh look at this hit that we're not even talking about, Kirby Joseph. Blah, blah, blah. It's just like, okay, you guys are like going out of your way at this point. It's ridiculous. It's un. I mean. I want to throw the word unprofessional out there Ooh, a no, little bit. I, I thought you were going to say it's very unbecoming. And I was <laughs> like, yes, that's a great. That That's a high road word. Down, Downton Abbey way of you going about your takedown of Daily Norseman. It did. It just felt like too much. Like it felt like there was, was a line and they, and they clear. Yes, it was goofy. They clearly put both feet over the line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Like it just, I don't know. I legit, I was like, is this a bit? I, I and you know what? I even get it in the middle of the game. If you're pissed off at Kirby Joseph for what sure. he did to TJ Hawkinson and you're calling One him tweet. dirty and all that in the midst of the game, I get it. Sure. You can do I, I I very well might do the same thing. But th- like there. two months later, when the Lions are in the NFC championship game, they're still running their mouth. It's oh, been, who was- had Anthony Barr for a while. And you know, we weren't sitting there, you know, come on, man. Who was actually a dirt ball? What were you gonna say? Well, no, two things. One, Anthony Barr was the one who put Rodgers into the turf, right? Yeah. Yes. And that's okay. why they made that rule. That should have been the Anthony Barr rule because that's why they made that rule, the landing on the body weight joint. Go sure. ahead. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, Anthony Barr. But who was is, who is the guy who was here for a cup of coffee that did it in the Saints game? Bruce Griffin. Irvin. No, Bruce oh, Irvin. Yes, yes. Remember? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, he did that to Derek Carr. <laughs> Bruce and... Irvin, who won the, the Raider, the – the, the Saints, Saints game? game for us yeah, by yeah. injuring Derek by putting Jameson, Jameson Winston into the game. Yeah. Okay. How yeah. bomb that cat. Um, that was bad. It was, bl- it was blatant. I was like, that's a flag. But um, here, uh, the the defensive tackle who clearly drove their knee into Amon Ross St. Brown's yeah, that's right. midsection. He wrote a whole article yeah. about that. Yeah. And it's like. He didn't, he didn't get fined, right? Yeah, he didn't get fined. Um, that was a non-football play. But, you know, we weren't tweeting about it into January because we had bigger fish to fry. Yeah. Man, well, yeah, okay, fish. so maybe that's the problem too, right? Is yeah. that like Vikings fans were in their feelings because – Too much time on se- their hands. Yeah, their season was over. Because and... they saw the Lions get as far as the Vikings ever have in the playoffs. God, you know what? I might be tweeting like that too if I got to watch that much Nick Mullins football. You know what I mean? I might be oh. that ornery. I might have that disposition if I had to live through the roller coaster ride that he... was Joshua Dobbs. <laughs> you know what? And then and yeah. then Nick Mullins. And there was a little Jaron Hall in there. Like <laughs> I'm just glad that I was so right about the Joshua Dobbs demise, man. Cause like, I'm like, get the hell out of here. Like, it's just not going to work. People are like, Oh yeah, this is amazing. I was like, nah, this is not gonna. I'm always, you're rooting for the underdog, right? I was a little nervous. (laughs) Were you? I was like, I was like their defense is, their defense was so much better than I expected it to be. And I'm like, well, Josh Dobbs is at least giving them something different. And like something that's yeah. at least working a little bit. And we know the Lions freaking suck at stopping mobile quarterbacks. So I'm like, yeah, please start Nick Mullins. I don't care if he can throw the ball way better. Yeah. I was a teensy bit nervous because I was like, Joshua Dobbs is the exact kind of quarterback that gives the Lions problems. Yeah. Um, but also I didn't like how much national support was behind Josh Dobbs. Yeah. And I love rooting for the underdog, but it was annoying how they like just anointed him. Like, Oh my God. He like his lineman didn't even know his cadence and he won the football game. Okay. I'm like, okay. But, but at the same time, him coming in and winning a football game when Kevin O'Connell is not only calling the plays for him, but describing the plays for him because he got there midweek. That's kind of cool. He works for NASA. I expect that shit from him, to be honest with you. You know? He ought to, like, he's, come on. No, Whatever. that's cool. That's cool. But I also wouldn't, like, I, I wouldn't be impressed if a student was like, oh, hey, I got a 98% on my test. And I'd be like, oh, wow, you really studied hard. And it's like, well, no, my teacher was over my shoulder giving me the answers the entire oh, time. Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. Who, who did that they play? Not with not that? Who did they, a fair who did they play? 
Who did they play for that game anyway? I don't remember. I don't know. Probably 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 a bad team. team. Probably a bad team. Yeah. Remember nobody that fact, game when, nobody fact checked that. <laughs> remember the game? What didn't didn't Dobbs play the game? Them and the Bears just wouldn't score points. Oh god, that game was awful. Oh, terrible. Uh, no, the uh, the Raiders, the Raiders game. Remember? It was, oh, that's right. It was the, the Raiders. The the Vikings yeah, won three nothing. Yeah. Yes. yes, yes. Didn't Atlanta Dobbs get bet- Didn't Dobbs get benched? Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> Falcons, <laughs> Mickey Mouse ass organization. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, uh, careful. That's. You're talking about the future home of Kirk Cousins and or uh, Justin Fields. Justin it's going to be one of the NFC North cast. It is. Wait, why um, do they think Kirk Cousins is going there? I don't know. That's. I think that's a rumor that's popped up today. That's I think rumor. that came from freaking, uh, what's his name, man? Goofball, pro football. Oh, pro football talk? Talk. Yeah. Maybe. I don't, know. I don't think. <laughs> Did it come from at the goat Mahomes? Because apparently he's a source that everyone feels like <laughs> retweeting today. <laughs> Oh man! Oh, that's that Chiefs account. I yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, the last thing I want to say the, is like Falcons. It's so weird to me <laughs> that that the Vikings have become like our biggest rival, and I don't. I mean, it's more like we've become the Vikings' biggest rival because yeah. I've had no animosity towards the Vikings at all. And in fact, when they had that one successful run with the Minneapolis Miracle, I was like, "This is freaking cool." Yeah. Like the Minneapolis miracle. Was, oh, I love that. Was one of the fav- my favorite moments of the past decades in the NFL. It was an incredibly cool moment. I just remember I was in California at the time. I spent like, the entire night just refreshing YouTube, watching for live reactions. Just like, the you know, the, the videos that everyone fakes nowadays, but it felt at least real in the moment where it's just like Vikings fans reacting in the moment to this happening, whether it's people in the crowd their, their, their videos from their phones in the crowd or, or at home watching. Like I just spent the entire night refreshing and just wanting to watch more and more of those. Yeah. Why, why uh, can't yeah. you be happy for us Vikings fans? Why can't you be happy? Why can't you be watching Lions fans cry when Amon Ra gets the first down against Matthew Stafford and the Rams? They turned into haters really quick. And I used to always say, like I would t- talk, you know, cash shit about the Packers and Bears fans just naturally but I'm like Vikings fans are cool for the most part yeah now that's all over I don't I don't like y'all y'all showed your you showed your ass uh, so no nope. like I I know I know more good Bears fans and I never thought I'd ever say that in my Ooh, life I don't know about that <laughs> I don't know about that I'm not ready to go that far we've hey I Bear- think we have we have like a couple of like solid Windy City gridiron connections for first bite yeah. We do, but Taylor I'm, Dahl is great. Burkus is great. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna warn you. By the end of 2024, you are gonna absolutely hate Bears fans. Yeah, no, I will. Even, even maybe, even maybe by the end of the off season, because they're they're gonna be a very cocky bunch this off season. I can guarantee. It doesn't matter what they do with Justin Fields or the first overall pick. With the way they finished last year, th- that they were last year, right? Copy, paste, and print is what I was going to say. Like, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it, was Adam, it was Adam Rank on NFL Network being <laughs> no, like, God, 11 and 5. Adam Rank, no. <laughs> no one can take Adam Rank seriously anymore. Like, He's on TV. He's on TV. <laughs> I don't understand, I, th- I, I think don't. Lions fans have, like, they know who Adam Rank it now is. after. And honestly, there are a lot of Bears writers. There's, there's another one in particular, I'm not going to name names, who, like. Oh, I know. Yep. And, and I follow him because, like, when he writes – objectively he's good but he's to me like he's not objective anymore like every single thing that happens to the bears is oh my gosh what a brilliant move oh my god they're in such a good position it's it's like all right you have got to take a (laughs) couple couple tints off your rose colored glasses no he won't man that's you're you're driving with an illegal tint right now in your rose colored glasses (laughs) You're going to run off the road, sir. There's a cliff ahead of you. Uh, Heath Rennie, thank you for the sub on YouTube. Slyest Rye, thank you for the 30 months subscribed using your Twitch Prime, which is always a good reminder if you're on Twitch or if you're on YouTube and you want to jump over to Twitch for a second, if you guys are subscribed to Amazon Prime, you can link that to your Twitch account and subscribe to us for free. 
doesn't cost you a damn thing except your Amazon Prime subscription for that free. you're already paying for. Come over here on Twitch, use it, use it every month. It doesn't auto renew. It's a way. Or to you sub- lose it. You tech. I mean, I, kind of. Yeah, I guess. If you don't Opportunity use it for- cost. Sure. Um, but it's a way to support us in a way that doesn't cost you a thing. Um, so if, if you do only watch us on YouTube and you've, you've thought about ways like, Hey, you guys create a ton of content. I haven't paid for any of it, whether it's written video. If you have that level of guilt, which I'm not saying you should, this, this is the internet age. Most content is free these days, but if you ever have just a smidge of that guilt, come over to Twitch, create an account. It's a free account to create link your Amazon prime, click the subscribe button, click the little prime checkbox. It's free. And we get the same money that we would from a normal sub. Couldn't have said it better myself. It's my one. It's my one little pitch. If you and also if you're on Twitch and you wonder other ways that you can support us, I think I want to say exclamation point support uh, brings up a uh, a doc that has all that lays all the ways you can support us. The percentages that we get if you're ever interested in. Is it better for me to subscribe or donate or bits or whatever? All those details are there. <clears throat> uh, 100 Bits from Nick the Greek says, I'm going to read this one without reading it first. So we'll see where this one goes. I miss the quote, Ben Johnson is a soy boy storylines <laughs> and the Josina Anderson articles that were vague and badly written to understand I wish they had come out now after I was over being sad about losing. Must have been dynamite content for the rest of the NFL. <laughs> the Ben Johnson Washington Commander saga will go down Whoa. in history. Just more goofy behavior. <laughs> just more, I like that you call it goofy. I legitimately love that you call it goofy. <laughs> it, 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 it disarms things, right? It does. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's me. It's me taking it in place of something I could say that's meaner, and I'm like, don't say that. <laughs> but I do like don't that. Say it's, that out loud. It's, it's like, it. I think it gets at the ridiculousness of it, where it's like, you could say they're being a dick. You can see they're being an a hole, but if you just call them goofy, then it's just like, it gets to the point of like, let's just not take these idiots seriously. <laughs> yeah, y'all are doing too much, man. That's how I look at it. <laughs> Didn't get didn't get picked. Very pick me energy, and then it didn't work. <laughs> Lord, RGA says Mike Flory is mad on Twitter. What is what is he mad about now? Dude, he's oh, always man. mad. What on is Twitter. he? Yeah, I was gonna say, what's he mad about now? I I need I need to know. Does that make me a bad person? That when someone says I'm like, ooh, spill the dish. That's not how you di- spill the dish. That's not a thing. Spill the tea. <laughs> spill the tea. Spill the dish works too. We're old. It's okay. We're all spill the dish, guys. Well, what was the other one? What was the one that you uh, was it? Quiet as a. No, I I should have said quiet as a mouse. I said something as a mouse. Yeah, what's some? It was something as a mouse. Subtle as a mouse, maybe. Steady. I said steady Steady as a mouse. Steady as a mouse. Steady as a mouse. (laughs) See mice like shaking. I'm not sure they're so steady. Yeah, they're pretty erratic. I, no, it's it's the I'll exact say. opposite. You know? <clears throat> no, but we I, I love all with these idioms. Okay, I don't know I don't know what this is in reference to, but his latest tweet is quote to the folks who try to dismiss our reports by saying we have no sources or whatever, you realize we had like fifty guests on our show last week from Indy, right? You realize pretty much everyone in the league reads pro football talk, right? You realize I've been doing this for 23 years, right? That was a real tweet. He tweeted that. <laughs> that is a real tweet. And with oh, each yeah, he's pissed. each uh, question, um, what kind of question is that? A rhetorical question. Yeah. There is there is one additional question mark at the end of each. Oh yeah. Oh, so he it goes like there. one, two, three. Oh, I guess, I guess it just goes one, one, three. But the last one is three. Uh, Jake Dobbs said mature. <laughs> Super humble guy. He's just a little jerk, man. You can just tell, right? Florio. Oh, okay. So oh, this, no. this must be in references to the Kirk Cousin. Kirk Cousins. Yeah. Okay, because his tweet on Kirk Cousins is, we're picking up very credible indications that Kirk Cousins is planning a potential move of his family from Minnesota to Atlanta. 
I could see Kirk Cousins in Atlanta just from a, you know. Yeah, that would work. <clears throat> it's collusion. Kirk Cousins. They're one of the few teams that could rival Minnesota in terms of skill guys, too, just because, you know, they don't have Justin Jefferson, but they got a lot. Dude, just imagine, though. Like, from one offseason to the next, last offseason, your organization was posting articles on their website that were saying, we do not want Lamar Jackson. <laughs> to one year from then. You are never going to hold that against them. <laughs> In particular, because they were also in play for Deshaun Watson, right? Dude, you're in play for Deshaun Watson the year before. Yeah. Now you're now you're not at all interested in Lamar Jackson. But then a year from then, you're going to be interested in... <laughs> Kirk Cousins. In, in, how old is Kirk? Is he 38? He's got to be close to that. Got to be up there, man. He was the Robert Griffin the third draft. Coming back from 35. coming back coming back from It'll it. Well, you know what? He's 35, 36, going on 39 because he ruptured his Achilles last year. So Yeah, that adds four years. It's just how the math works. <laughs> but but hey, you didn't want Lamar Jackson. You didn't want you didn't want the league MVP. What do you okay, what do you guys think really happened with Lamar? Collusion. For sure. How something like that, man. Yeah, I don't there's no other there's no other way, right? Other, otherwise, you're saying Arthur Smith is a racist. <laughs> <laughs> you're telling Wait, me that Deshaun Arthur Smith Watson. didn't. Wa- <laughs> well, yeah. Well, well. I don't know. Okay, so maybe I walk back my claim. <laughs> I like that that their interest in Deshaun Watson is a sign of better character. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh God. <laughs> Is it? I know. Then we're in that dichotomy. I'm like, well, you know. I keep going back to that like gif of the girl going, eh. you know, kombucha lady, lady. David. Oh man, oh, I, man. Just I just really don't know. Yeah, that. See, <coughs> I don't know. Okay, how do you not? But have you ever seen? Have you ever, 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 ever seen an official team website, AtlantaFalcons.com, <laughs> within moments of Lamar Jackson being available? <laughs> They weren't Publish. the only weren't they they weren't the only team that did that, right? Teams that came I, out and and specifically said we're not it's bizarre. Wait, hold, but when do you ever hear that about a veteran player? Like teams coming out and saying we're not interested in a player. I don't know. It was I'm not trying to defend anything, but it was a weird time where like we we had just come off the Deshaun Watson contract. And, like, the future of quarterback contracts felt like it was in the balance. Mm-hmm. Like, are we are we going to make this NBA turn to where everything is going to be guaranteed or almost everything is going to be guaranteed? And I think there was at least a little bit of fear in that when you, when you are talk, when you're trying to land Lamar and it was very, very clear that Lamar wanted a ton of guaranteed money. Yeah. But that doesn't necess- that doesn't really excuse everything that happened. No, or no, it does not. To. No. Nick the Greek has, I don't look at that, Jeremy. <laughs> okay. A hundred bits from Nick the Greek says, do you guys think Kwesi Adolfo Mensa? I, I, I've never actually said his name out loud. I hope I didn't butcher it, but the Vikings GM uh, got a GM job solely because he looks like he has a huge brain when people take photos of him. Kind of like how people kept, calling Patricia a rocket science when in fact he'd spend the last 15 years sipping to Bill Belichick and eating nacho cheese. (laughs) It is, it is, it is funny how much mileage we got out of like Matt Patricia is a rocket scientist. We did man. The nacho cheese pit threw me out. (laughs) Kwesi. What did I say? Kwesi? Kwesi. (laughs) <laughs> give me a look at a picture uh, of him all right i have we've seen the pictures Nick. i don't know if i have you think he has it a just huge... pull it up man it just does look like he's got a little bit like of a big head it goes it gets bigger at the top you know what i mean like it's like a you know, okay okay i do you know I do kind of see it. you know what i'm saying <laughs> nick said he plays up the brain god <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's, it's, its head does have a little Mars attacks shape to it. Yeah, you know, I'm like, dang, that he might be having a big old brain up there, for real. You, you could think that. <laughs> like a light bulb. How oh, have I dang. never noticed? This? <laughs> If I type in Mars Attacks, is anything going to come up next to his name? I don't know. Maybe. Try it. I doubt uh, it. I was hoping someone had had made a side-by-side before. Way too obscure of a reference. That's not that obscure, is it? Jeremy? For, for us, it isn't. You, I'm old. You would be, you would be surprised. <clears throat> I can unsee it now, for sure. That's... <laughs> Nick said he shapes the sides to make it look bigger. <laughs> Man, look at that smug smile. Holy crap. Oh, dude. Nick. <laughs> All right. Uh, I got to go. I'm going to go get dinner. All right. We should get out yeah, of here as well. We should... Bye, guys. Yeah. Bye, Ryan. Bye, Ryan. <laughs> um, you're going to be labeled Chris probably for a second here. Wait, that's not what I want. You're actually labeled Morgan. I'm labeled Chris. How did that happen? I meant to go off. Perfect. There we go. Um, All right. We will be live next. Okay. I haven't set anything up tomorrow, but in an ideal world, we're live tomorrow night. Talking more NFL Combine. Because I feel like we kind of scratched the surface. We we talked about the main guys and the main positions. But I want to get a little deeper. And I have to reach out to a certain person that you guys definitely know. And maybe talk a little more NFL Combine with them. Wednesday, I'm crossing my fingers for a night version, a a primetime version of the midweek mailbag. And then, thir- oh, wow, we, I just realized we might go four nights in a row. Because then Thursday night, I, I want to do our free agency preview show where we'll talk about <clears throat> what the line should do. Lay out a blueprint type of thing. And then probably do our, uh, what I guess we're calling the mainline call-in show on Saturday morning. So five total podcasts this week, potentially. (laughs) Saying that out loud, I'm like, I don't want to commit to that. But that's that's what we're going to reach for. I can't promise all of that, but we'll see. Um, Colorado's on Wednesday. What does that mean? Wings, Colorado? I don't know. Anyways, that's what we're looking for. Um, If you miss anything, you can catch replays on YouTube or Twitch. Obviously, obviously things will be up on the podcast feed as well. But uh, I don't got anything else other than to thank Morgan for filling in last minute today. Appreciate that, buddy. Yeah, no problem, guys. It's always fun. All right. Well, then let's get out of here. Uh, I'm not going to raid anybody because I don't think anybody, any of my buds are on this late. Unless you guys wanted to go to Kurt Benkert's stream. Former Packers quarterback, now turned Twitch stream football analyst. Eh. I don't I have trust. a friend playing Outlast 2, but I don't know if that, it's, a, it's a video game, I guess. <laughs> we'll just get out of here. We'll see you guys maybe.